through, and I know the whole world is uh, watching, and, and for that I ask for a moment of silence for, for the, what they're going through. Thank you, sir. Roll call. Carlson? Here. Maniscalco? Here. Citro? Here. Vieira? Here. Miranda? Here. And Goose? Here. We have a physical form. Thank you, Madam Deputy Clerk. Mr. Shelby? Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Members of the City Council, Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. This is a view I have not seen in quite some time. Yes, sir. From this angle. Um, and welcome to the public. Uh, as. Uh, Councilman Maniscalco said this is the uh, first meeting in uh, two years that uh, the public is back in City Council's chambers. So what I'd like to state is that the public and the citizens of Tampa are able to watch, listen, and view this meeting on Spectrum Channel 640, Frontier Channel 15, and on the web at tampa.gov forward slash live stream. Now, members of the public can attend in person in City Council chambers in Old City Hall or pursuant to Council's um, um, motion, participate in this public meeting um, by using what is referred to by Florida statutes and rules as communications media technology, the same technology for virtual and hybrid meetings that City Council has been using since the, pa the pandemic started. Now the public should be aware that to speak remotely during public comment with the use of CMT, pre-registration is required and those instructions are noticed in the notice of the public meeting, also within the agenda and also on City Council's webpage at tampa.gov forward slash city council. Now, to pr participate remotely in today's public hearings using CMT, pre-registration was also required too and that is available, the instructions again are available uh, in the notice and in the agenda and on the City Council's webpage. Now, please note that in order to participate in quasi-judicial matters via CMT, cell phones and smartphones are not compatible because it does not have access to video and audio, which is required. That being said, Mr. Chairman, I would ask City Council to um, waive the rules to uh, allow the continued use of CMT uh, as has been custom. Moved by Mr. Maniscalco. Second by Mr. Citro. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Thank you, sir. General, tough agenda items today, gentlemen. Uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, you will put everybody on the time of the day, for, including city council members. Uh, we have a listing here, so let me get right to it with public comment. Multitude of people speak. Uh, I will call it out by number. Those persons will come up and speak at that time, Mr. Shelby. Yes, sir. Uh, let me show we go and you'll be recognized. Oh, I, I, you, so you're talking about the approval of the agenda? I'm going to go out. I want to get to some house cleaning first and I'll get to the approval agenda. But I want well, to make sure it's clean. That, what I'm saying, uh, what I'm suggesting, Council, is that part of the housekeeping is during the process of the approval of the agenda and the addendum. So if we could just uh, include all, all that. All right, as you wish, sir. Thank as you, you wish. All right, let's look at the agenda, gentlemen. You're I'm sorry, you're I, I just want to say quickly, um, it's, it, it's obvious up here, and I wanted to go and said that we're missing one of our colleagues today. And I just wanted to uh, personally say that I wish um, John Dingfelder and his wife well, and I hope that uh, their nightmare will end soon. Thank you. Uh, my sin, Mr. Zachary, so we've lost a true friend up here, a true friend of the people. All right, let's look at the agenda, gentlemen. Madam Deputy Clerk, Mr. Shelby? Yes, sir. Did you want to discuss any changes, additions, additions, deletions, approval, um, uh, excuse me, uh, to the uh, uh, agenda. You were talking about your housekeeping. Now would be the time you said. I believe that we, we're going to, we have a walk-on for this afternoon, correct, sir, from Madam Clerk? That is correct. We have two walk-ons. Two walk on addendum. All right. And so the first walk-on is the um, um, memorandum transmitting City Council's appointment policy and procedure guidelines for City Council's consideration and approval of the vacancy um, that exists on City Council. Uh, did you want to take that up at the end of the meeting? In the meeting, sir. That's, our, that's our business. So we'll take it in the meeting. Okay, that'll be taken up at the end of the meeting. And uh, Council Member Miranda uh, has transmitted a resolution um, uh, that he had uh, 
made a motion on it in the past. Um, I can have that um, copied and distributed to council. We could take it up later, Mr. Miranda. <coughs> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, and also, you had made comment again with regard to public comment and the m the moving of was there a discussion i'm sorry of item 26 yes sir gentlemen as you know i pulled that item uh i'm looking uh at uh how we're going to do this for this police chief nominee is that we will take uh, up item number uh one which will be now number three now mr Vera, i think he's going to make a motion to scratch number two move number three up to number one and then we'll hear the police chief and as we hear the police chief, we will then take public comment. And during public comment, I have a list of that, that keeps coming that I will go down the list one through whatever until we stop. After that, we will take up item number 26 or any recommendation or reference to the police chief. Mr. Randy, has your hand, yeah, sir? Thank you. I, I, there's something called the rules of procedure, and I'm not questioning anything you said, but I wish that the city attorney would uh, re look at the city council attorney rules of procedure, make sure that everything's done in correct order. As you wish, sir. Well, I, I, I will certainly do that, and uh, I... Um, I think it was less than better in 2019. The rules... A procedure. Of mm -hmm. rules of procedure. Yes, sir. With regard to... The, the, the process that we're going through today. There's a process... <coughs> oh, are you saying... Oh, are you referring to the section of the charter? No, I'm referring to just the rules. This little thing here. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, did you have a question or? A no, I, I have no questions. I just want to make sure that we follow whatever rules we made uh, adopted back in March 21st of 2019, sir. I see. My understanding is that uh, based on my uh, analysis, um, I believe you are, and also Ms. Zellman, and I have had the opportunity to discuss uh, at least the procedures with regard to um, item 26. Um, if you have any questions, sir, Please do raise them. No, believe it or not, I found this looking for something else for Charlie Chris, and it fell out of this thing that I have in my pocket here. And uh, I, I just read it last night, and I just want to make sure that it's followed. That's all. Thank Mr. you. I'm not questioning and, and, anything. And, and if I can, Mr. Miranda raises a very excellent point. If there is at any time the question about the procedure, the correct process under Robert's Rules of Order is to make, is to make a point of order and present that to the chair, and we can resolve the issue. Got it. Mr. Uh, Shelby, do we need to vote on moving 26 up versus taking up the consent, uh, Dr. Sir? That is, if that is the pleasure of council, the time to do that is during the approval of the agenda and the addendum. So if there is any objection to that, the time to raise that by council is now. May I, sir? You recognize. Uh, so I, I want to be clear on what we're doing here. Are we looking at having the presentation uh, being done first, then public comment, then council comments? Is that what we're voting on? Yeah, then to 26 would be pulled to then go vote on 26. Okay. So I'm here again. I'm not questioning one, especially city council attorney, on the rules of procedure that I read last night. It says the public speaks first, and then we do what we have to do. That's yeah. under, that's under uh, let me see if I find it. Well, it, well, we, I mean, it, I mean, I was trying to do it the easy way, but if you prefer, no, I'm not, I'm Mr. not Mr. questioning. Moran, I just, I'm just, saying, I just want to kind of get in some kind of order. Yeah, so I, you I don't understand. Feel. I'm not questioning you at all, sir. I'm just saying that I want to make sure because right. of the importance Mr. of everything. Check the rule that and see what we need to do. Three, so public comment under will come. rule three B two. Three B two. The order of business, the approval of the agenda, then the public comment. Ceremonial, and we can ask the clerk, ceremonial items are normally placed first on the agenda, even though it is, it's, it's, it's traditionally been that. Um, it's not in your, these rules from 2019, but it, it, historically it's been under the first item on the agenda. If council's pleasure is to hear the public first, then you can move the public comment up to above the ceremonials, but customarily that has been the case. I should point out, council, what, sir? It's not my pleasure. It's whatever the rules say. Well, I understand, sir. Um, ceremonial activities and or presentations are not on the following order of the transaction of business. It's placed first on the agenda. Um, there is no action to be taken on items one, two, or three. And pursuant to Florida statutes, uh, that before a vote can be taken, 
that the public should have an opportunity to speak before the council takes final action on something. So that is a, um, uh, a rule from, I believe, um, I forget the year, but it was in, uh, towards the end of um, the last decade, but it was an adjustment to the council's rules um, as a result um, in section, in chapter 286. Um, to allow the public to have the opportunity to speak before a vote is taken. And that's why historically we take no action on ceremonial items until the public has an opportunity to speak. If you want to, com if you want to hear the public before ceremonial activities, you can do that. You can change the order of business when you approve the agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Carlson was first served as recognized. Mr. Carlson, you recognized. Yeah. Councilmember Miranda, were you just talking about the order of ceremonial versus public comment, or were you talking about the, um, the order of the, the police chief dominee speaking before? Mr. Carlton, the only thing I'm saying is that this came into my hands yesterday from my own house, and I, I didn't even know I had, to be honest with you. And under this rules that were less adopted by Resolution uh, 246 from 2019, it says the meeting, Rule 3, then it goes to B2. The following order shall be observed in the transaction of business at a regular meeting. Invocation pledge of allegiance was done. Roll call of the minutes was done. Approval of the agenda. Public comment for any matters other than public hearing. Then request by the public for reconsideration. It goes on and on. All I'm saying is I just want to follow these rules in case there's anyone is dissatisfied, we can address it with the rules. That's all I'm saying. Anyone dissatisfied, or we could go the way it goes. I mean, I don't want anybody being sad, but I was trying to make it easier by having number one, public, the vote, or we can follow the way we've already always done it. What is your pleasure, gentlemen? One at a time. Not mine. Mine to follow the rules of procedure. Mr. Uh, um, Vieira? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Just really quick, if I may, the unique part about uh, presentation and number one is related to a vote uh, on, on 26. So there is an argument that they should go together. Another issue may very well be that the presentation may take longer, and, and, and we're talking about it thereby making it longer, that we have a lot of public comment to get out of the, to move before uh, the, the, the vote ultimately. Just another consideration. Again, I, 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 I think we should just vote on it and, and see how it goes to move forward. Citro? I would always let your public comment first. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right, so what we'll do, gentlemen, we'll make it easy. We'll continue with the approval agenda. We'll go as the agenda is written. That's a pleasure. And that's, that's easy for me. Right? Okay. Clarification. So is it the ceremonial activities will then move to after the public comment? Is that, am I correct? No, that? no, no, no. We're going to go by the agenda. Since people said we're going to go by the agenda. Yes. And then we'll take public comment. So <laughs> I was trying to make it a little simplified, but since uh, we, we'll making sure the rules are in place, then we'll go ahead, we'll take, we'll do Sarah Milner's number one, we'll be Miss O'Connor, then we'll go, go Mr. Vieira, we'll have a scratch he has, and then uh, the, 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 the number three, sir. Uh, if, if, may I, Mr. Chair? You recognize. Um, I, I had told the gentleman at number three that they could be number one. Again, I don't want to, Vietnam Veterans of America, eight minutes. I, I, I think, and again, I leave it to you, sir. Decisions have to be made. I'm going to make a decision. Point blank. Uh, number three. Uh, any objection to moving number three None. to number one? No. All right. What? Say that again. Number three. Number to three. Number one. To number. Okay. Mr. Vieira, are you going to make a motion to scratch number two, correct? Yes, sir. Make that motion now, sir. Thank you, sir. I hereby move that the A. Brown Ministries Returning Citizens uh, Ordinance be moved to April 21st of Sorry. 2022. Sorry. Both the presentation by the community partners for the returning citizens as well as the ordinance, if I may. Thank you. Second by Mr. Mascal. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. All right. Two is taken care of. Three will go to number one. One will go to three. And now, uh, sir. So the public is clear. You had mentioned item 26. When did you want to take that up? Uh, I wanted to see. I, I'd like to take it up uh, after public comment. Now, uh, if, if there are any objections to that, gentlemen? Any objections, gentlemen? All right. So 26 was pulled. We'll be taken up after public comment, sir. Understood. And I just want to uh, refer to the council's rules, Rule 4K. Rule 4K does state that the, sh the chair shall decide all questions of procedure and order, and the decision shall stand unless reversed by a majority vote of the uh, entire council. 
Thank you, Mr. So Shelby, for the clarification, know, sir. So with regard to that, is there anything else on the addendum that needs to be um, discussed? You're recognized, sir. Yeah, just um, uh, item number 28. Uh, I don't need staff. I just want to pull it for separate 20? vote. 28? 28. I just want to pull it for separate All vote. Right. Uh, All right. Mr. Maniscalco will second that. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. So 28 will go. Um, 29, I want to make a comment, but we don't need to pull it. Um, All right. 20, uh, for, sorry, 46, I'd like to pull for a separate vote also, please. 46, separate vote. Any other changes, additions, deletions, council? Can you the amendment? As amended? As amended, yes. Mr. Scalco has moved it. Second? Second. Second by Mr. Pierre. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion granted. We're open for business, gentlemen. All right. Mr. Pierre, you're up, sir. Thank you, sir. I Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It's really nice to be back and see everybody here today. Oh, and we got a movie uh, by the Vietnam Veterans of America. Go, go ahead, go ahead.
and thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I have here with me for a very brief uh, discussion here today, about two minutes or so, because I know our time is pressed today. It goes without saying. We have Colonel Ron Rook, who's here, who is the uh, wonderful gentleman over there on that motorcycle. We have uh, Avi Zamichis, who's here. We have uh, uh, Mike O'Dell, who's here, former uh, president of Vietnam Veterans of America, Chapter 787. Colonel Jim Fletcher was supposed to come here today, but had a broken car. God bless him. Uh, we also have in the audience, I saw Gold Star Sister, whose brother was up in that video, uh, Paula Rodriguez France. I see Vicki Cardin here, Raphael Pisano, and others here in support. And I wanted uh, Colonel Rook to come up and talk about an event that I hope everyone from the community comes uh, next Saturday, I believe it is, to support the Vietnam Veterans of America. Go ahead, Colonel. Yes, Saturday the 26th of March at 9 o'clock, the Vietnam Veterans of America are presenting a memorial to that park, Veterans Memorial Park. At 10 o'clock, we're doing our annual Welcome Home Vietnam Veterans uh, celebration. So please pass to all you people that you know are Vietnam veterans and you come out because as you know we were not welcome back home when we came back from Vietnam. So come out and welcome us home. <laughs> Thank you. And if I may, Mr. Chair, if it doesn't break the quorum, let's give our Vietnam veterans a hand. Mr. Carlson, you recognize, sir? I, um, I, I just want to, first of all, thank uh, Councilmember Vieira for bringing you all here. I want to thank you all for your continued service. Thank you to all the Vietnam uh, veterans for your service. I grew up in the Vietnam War watching, um, watching it on TV, and I can't imagine what you all went through, and I thank you so much for your service. Um, I, some, some folks know that I lived in Singapore five years, and whatever feedback you got when you got back here, Singapore, they very much appreciate you all, because if you had not stopped uh, what was happening in Vietnam, it would have gone all the way to Malaysia and Singapore. So, um, you know, thanks from many parts of the world for everything you all did. You recognize, sir? Well, first and foremost, welcome home. Um, I've always had a deep respect for Vietnam veterans for the sacrifice that you made for this country, whether you were drafted or whether you signed up, whatever it was, you're heroes, and I want you to know that. Um, I've had the honor of meeting uh, so many Vietnam vets over the years. Um, two years ago, I was with Councilman Vieira. I had the honor of sitting next to Roger Donlin and his wife at the Medal of Honor breakfast, and he was the first Medal of Honor recipient uh, from 1964-65 at the beginning, and uh, what an honor it was to be there, and in the room with so many heroes. You know, every time I go to Washington, D.C., I always make it a point to visit the wall. Uh, it's especially um, powerful at night. Uh, I've left my hotel in the middle of the night to go for a walk to the Lincoln Memorial, and I walk down to the wall. And, uh, you know, seeing all those names, 58,000-plus names, and so many of them that came from this area. Um, for those that know me, my friends and whatnot, I like to visit cemeteries, uh, especially here in the uh, city of Tampa where my grandparents are buried. It's, they're surrounded by Vietnam uh, soldiers, those that died at 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, and I make it a point every Memorial Day to uh, leave a flag at their uh, grave site to know that they're appreciated not by family and friends that knew them, but by the new generation, the people that didn't know them, and know that they will never be forgotten. So again, thank you, and it's an honor that, uh, that you're here with us today. Mr. Citro? Gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of, of our military force that served in a useless war. And because of your bravery and others like you that knew the duty that they had to the citizens of this country, I say thank you for my freedoms. Thank you, gentlemen. Randy, you recognize, sir? First of all, my apologies. I have an appointment with a thing called J-O-B, job, and uh, I appreciate that very much. But when you look at back in history and you realize that democracy is not free, just compare what we here in America have 
and compare it with any other country in the world. We take a lot of things for granted, but we forget the price that we paid for having that right to speak, to have a difference of opinion. When you look at right now, when somebody in the news media in another country puts up a sign and gets hauled off to jail, that doesn't happen here that often, if not at all. It shouldn't be happening. And thank you for the sacrifices that your generation made. It's not only those that gave the lives, but the lives that were home, that they don't have that life to live without those men and women who perished. And those are the consoling factor of democracy. It's not free, it's very costly. And I never forget, I was in a foreign country not too long ago, what about five years ago, when I was in a cab, and a man asked me, how's America? I said, we're going through a little hump in the road. He said, you're humping the road to get better, but the hump that's here will get worse. And those words were just chilling to me, and I want to thank each and every one of you for what you've done. Thank you very much. Well, gentlemen, we thank you for your service, of course. As you look at the, the video, I see a gentleman, uh, two or three, I, I know personally. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Beer, we are always are enlightened when you bring historical data, information, and folks to this council to enlighten our community who don't know to know. So I'm glad that you were able to do this uh, versus our regular uh, new time slots. Uh, this was valuable uh, to see and watch these gentlemen and, and just to be able to let the public know that we're grateful for the work you've done, grateful for the work you've done for this country. So God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, may Mr. O'Donnell make a quick comment? Yes, sir. sir. Go ahead, I just sir. want to let everyone know that Vietnam veterans are dying at the rate of 600 a day and also seven of those veterans from Vietnam that were in that film have died of Agent Orange. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Vieira. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome home, gentlemen. Right. Mr. Vieira is walking out to take his photo shot as usual. He'll be back shortly. All right. Following the agenda, uh, item number two, was removed. We've heard from item number three. Now we'll go to item number one. Mr. Bennett. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Council. John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Good morning to the community. It's so nice to, to see us back in chambers, so many friends and colleagues over the years that have, have served in first responder roles, and people even here selling their birthday. So we appreciate all of that. Um, Chairman, if it's the will of, in the pleasure of council, we're willing to uh, defer to public comment until item 26. And then uh, that way we don't tie up time with two presentations, one for that and one for 26, if that's the pleasure of, of council. Second. My Mr. Maniscalco, second by Mr. Citro, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion granted. We'll go to public comment. Thank you, sir. All right, number one. I have a list here of numbered folks to speak. Oh, I'm sorry. The uh, Madam Deputy Clerk wants to go to virtual first, so we'll go to virtual first. That's uh, that to do what she wants us to do. She's in charge. Thank you, sir. The first speaker we have is Michael Randolph. Mr. Randolph, if you could hear me, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Randolph from the West Tampa RCP. Um, last year, um, 50 percent of folks that were arrested was arrested for guns. Violent crime is up 30% in our city. People are dying at a rate that's ridiculous. We met with the chief talking about strategy for how do we turn the agenda around. I was impressed that she was open to the idea that we have to look at a new school of folks to dealing with violence. I'm not about organization. I'm not about what people want from about solutions. She's the right person to look at this in new perspectives. I shared with her the different perspectives from around the country that does work. I also shared with her about a new approach to community policing to increase relationship between the community. Under this model, officers would have resources, for example, if a person's in need of substance abuse, they would have resources to refer that person if the person needs a job. All that stuff would be part of the community of police strategy. I also spoke with neighborhood groups, because I don't do anything about getting the feeling as to what do the neighborhood groups in West Tampa die. 
I'm in support of this team because she's willing to look at it in a different perspective and look at it from a perspective of new eyes. Folks, we cannot continue to do the same old, same old and expect the same result. I, uh, I, I support the appointment because now we can look at what's going around around the country and apply it to Tampa so we can stop the killings. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next speaker we have is Bishop Michelle Patty. If you can hear me, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Good morning. I'm Bishop Michelle B. Patty. I'm actually out of town, but I thought it was very important that I speak to this matter. 28 years ago, Chief Mary O'Connor was given a second chance. She used that opportunity to serve and protect the city, rising, raise, rising through the ranks to retire as assistant chief, one step from being the chief. Tampa is unique. Our mayor, Mayor Jane Castor, she served as chief. Mayor Jane Castor know in this season what we need to move this community forward, and that's Chief O'Connor. Chief O'Connor has a lot of experience, FBI experience. She's taught in other cities and been around the, the country. So with Chief O'Connor, we bring a unique perspective. She's able to process and do things uh, on a different level. So that's why I am in so full support of Chief Mary O'Connor. We ask that felons be given a second chance. And this is one of the reasons why, because with a second chance, look what a person can do. They can soar to the top. We also would like to say that when things have gone wrong years and years ago, 28 years ago, that's long enough. So people, we need to look at the fact that there is children, killing children in the streets of Tampa. Blood is flowing in the streets. We need someone that can take charge. Thank you so much. Let me, let me say something. Uh, before or against the nominee, we will have silence in this chambers. When your chance is to speak, you will speak. You give your comment. You respect it like anyone else. If you do not, I will have you removed by Mr. Talley, our, our officer of the room. Am I, am I clear, Mr. Talley? Yes. All right, let me see. Thank you, Chair. Next speaker we have is Ms. Jean Strohmeyer. Ms. Strohmeyer, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, Jean Strohmeyer here um, today. First, I want to just um, say um, we, about the Felder issue, I think that should never have happened, and, and I think we all know that that was a, a railroaded event for Mr. Dane Felder. Whether you like them or not, it shouldn't happen like that. And, and I believe the, um, the the people behind that just did do that for political reasons to get his vote silenced. And they succeeded in that battle, but not in the war, because because there's a lot of little soldiers out here that are are fighting for our city. Um, so back to the agenda. Um, I'm the, a lot of the agenda I see. There's a bunch of these contracts and bids. I, we have found that some of these contracts and bids show up in a little uh, newspaper that nobody's ever heard of, and others show up in the big newspapers. Um, there's some contractors that never get a chance to make a bid to the city. So these, all these um, publications for the bids on contracts need to be upfront for everybody to see. Everybody should get a chance to bid on it. As far as the new police chief, I don't know her, but it just, there was too many things that, that didn't seem right to a lot of people. You know, look at the newspaper, they just didn't feel that was the right thing. So I think that needs to be vetted a little bit more. Um, um, the 28 on the agenda, I don't know if I'll get to speak on that early, or later, but um, Bloomberg Consulting is a very biased um, consulting firm out of New York. Um, they are out of uh, Delaware, and that's Bloomberg, the billionaire, who we want to now, what, run our city behind the scenes. We're not comfortable with that. Um, 32 license plate readers, and y'all keep bringing that big brother to the city of Tampa. I'm not sure about that. Oh, back to the Bloomberg. We need to separate this, the duties. The mayor has a lot of power, so it's more like a dictatorship, as we're seeing. So we really need the um, city council to be able to do their job and separate the power so everybody has a voice. 
35 and 36, you have GTE. Um, we're leasing from GTE when we, the city of Tampa owns a lot of property. I don't know what kind of money we're spending on that, but I hope it's um, within, you know, within this, it needs to be looked into. Um, number 62, the tenant bill of rights. Again, I think that's a bad idea because it will put other people at risk of having to answer to government rather than their own private contracts between two individuals. 47 and 48, um, there's a lot of payouts that go into the year 2030 here. Um, so we're going to burden our future with debt um, up to the year 2030. That just looks bad to me. Can y'all look into those? And um, let's see, 63, I don't know if I'm allowed to speak about that one, but um, vote no on that privately initiated tech amendment. Ms. Shelby, recognize you promote that if you can. Uh, that's during the public hearing. If you wish to speak to that, you have that opportunity if you wish. Thank you. And so that's the things. Please look into everything. I appreciate it. And then you'll have a great day. Thank you, Jean. <clears throat> Next speaker we have is Lorraine Perino. If you can hear me, Ms. Perino, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Good morning. I'm Lorraine Perino. <clears throat> I was born at the Central Español Hospital on Bayshore. I'm a third generation Tampa Hispanic who until recently was always proud of my city. Hispanics comprise more than 25% of Tampa's population. Yet incredibly, Jane Castor has zero Hispanics in upper level management. This is a serious issue to all Tampa Hispanics and shows great disrespect to them. Promoting Major Ruben Delgado, a career TPD Hispanic employee to police chief was the mayor's perfect opportunity to correct this grievous injustice. She didn't. Not only was Major Delgado the logical choice, he was the right choice. Working his way to the top, he had the support of the entire Hispanic community and of other local law enforcement agencies too. Casper should have in good faith moved to correct the conspicuous deficit of Hispanics in her administration. Yet she made an unfair and unwise choice, choosing instead someone who won, was six years retired from the force, two, let her certification lapse and was unqualified to run the police department, Three, had a contentious past with TPD, including A, an arrest for DUI and assault of a police officer for which she was fired. B, a department leader who created a policy so racially unfair that TPD was cited by the U.S. Department of Justice. This lose, lose, lose is who Jane Castor selected to lead Tampa's finest. I read that Castor ordered staff to read your emails, counsel, so she could convince prominent Hispanics opposing O'Connor to support her. Wow. All of this is very disturbing to me. I hardly recognize Tampa government anymore. Staff is ordered to read city council's private emails, yet it is one of you who the city attorney accuses of violating government and sunshine laws. Lacking any Hispanics in upper management, Castor selects someone wholly inadequate for the chief's job, passing over a qualified Hispanic candidate. Yet again, it is one of you council who is accused of violating ethics laws and forced to resign in a shoddy lawsuit by the mayor's favorite deep pocket special interest group. Is city government now Alice in Wonderland, everything up, upside down and backwards, or has it become Putin's Russia? The sketchy awarding of the Rome Yard contract, the equally sketchy Hannah Street contract, the highly unpopular Pure proposal that the city rams down our throat three years in a row, and now the latest shock, a dedicated city council member who worked tirelessly to preserve Tampa's natural beauty and conserve the character and historic importance of our neighborhoods and ecosystems, has been railroaded into resigning as the mayor's appointed city attorney refuses to defend him. Things are going downhill fast in Tampa. If he isn't rightfully promoted to chief, Major Delgado should sue the city of Tampa for workplace discrimination. What has been done to him is illegal under federal law. I know because like Major Delgado, I too was a victim of workplace discrimination. I sued in federal court and I won. Tampa residents now look to you city council to provide the principal leadership currently lacking in city government. Please vote no to O'Connor and insist that Major Delgado be promoted to chief. He deserves it, and the Hispanic community certainly deserves it, too. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. No applause, folks. No applause. Again, everybody has an opportunity. All right, next speaker we have is Carolyn Wendy Eisler. If you can hear me, Ms. Eisler, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Good morning, city council members and staff. My name is Wendy Eisler, and I live in South Seminole Heights. I'm speaking with you today to voice my concerns regarding the process for the nomination of Mary Elizabeth O'Connor for Tampa Police Chief. My main concerns are the lack of transparency in the search and selection process, the absence of public access to the candidates in the infancy of the selection process, and now the rush to install an unconfirmed nominee into the role. 
So why was our search, search net cast so narrow? When asked about the process by a local newspaper, City of Tampa's communication director, Adam Smith, confirmed that the search was not open to the public. In addition, he stated that he was unable to provide a list of the candidates considered for the job. The process, which apparently netted only three viable candidates, was largely conducted in the dark and out of the public eye. The lack of access to the candidates left the public with no clear insight on, into what each of their visions were for the role as Tampa Police Chief, and more importantly, for the ideas about a plan to improve the relationship between the community members and the police force which was largely damaged in the wake of Viking Wild Black debacle and the mishandling of Black Lives Matter protesters. These facts notwithstanding, our mayor saw fit to nominate Mary O'Connor, a former Tampa Police Department colleague, who in fact has not been a police officer in Tampa for over five years. This is certainly a detriment for an incoming local leader, which begs the question, does Mary O'Connor truly understand the city of Tampa's unique com community policing needs and law enforcement challenges? Lastly, despite the fact that the mayor has the power to appoint the new police chief, our city's charter requires that at least four of the city's council, seven members, vote to confirm the mayor's selection. And yet, Mary O'Connor has already been acting in that capacity without confirmation. In the past week, she has been introduced as chief of police at every opportunity. This feels like usurping and is simply not the way Tampa's new police chief should be selected. We had an interim chief and there was no need to rush an unconfirmed candidate into the role. Why hasten the careful consideration of the best possible candidate? Don't we understand that who we choose to ultimately serve in this role matters a great deal, both now and in the future? After all, a former Tampa chief of police is now our mayor. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak, and may you act to allay the concerns of your constituents in this important matter. Last speaker we have is Ms. Fran Tate. If you can hear me, Ms. Tate, you have three minutes to speak. Please unmute yourself. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ms. Tate. I am Fran Tate, president of the Jackson Heights Neighborhood Association and assistant crime watch coordinator. Good morning, council members. It was requested for Chief O'Connor to visit the community so that we could get to hear from her and she gets to hear from us. On the 28th of February, the Jackson Heights Crime Watch Group attended the community forum addressing violent crime at St. Leo University. Chief O'Connor was there. She listened attentively to our concerns. She is vowed to help with the help of the community, see something, say something, people, to address the gun violence. She also stated that she would reopen cold cases and that she would institute a program to address mental health awareness within our own police force. We also share with her that there is a need for community policing in East Tampa especially. For these reasons, the Jackson Heights Neighborhood Crime Watch Group supports Mary Jane Castle's appointment of Mary O'Connor as police chief. Thank you for your time. Chair, that concludes the remote speakers for today. All right. All right, we'll go to public comment number one. Got up this morning to come, having had back surgery Excuse on me, Monday. If you could state your name for oh, us, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Carol yes, Parker Cowell. My husband Peter Cowell worked here 18 years before he resigned years back, and I wanted to come and speak for um, Mary O'Connor and the fact that her family, in many ways, has been a part of the police uh, effort, um, and both she and her husband. I've known her to be an honorable woman that represents the, the women's rights that we have needed 
I grew up in Plant City, moved to Tampa when, in 1966 when the biggest fight we won was being able to wear trousers to work. And that sounds so silly in these days, but it was that kind of a thing that women were trying to find their way up into uh, being able to make changes and make the city safer and stop the squabbling between um, neighborhoods and have them work together to make a metropolitan area because we've become a big city with a lot of people. Um, I had occasion to um, be in a speaking situation with Mary when she retired um, and went out into the lecture circuit to speak to other police departments and eventually to the FBI in the years that she was not actively working at the Tampa Police. And she did that, as I understand it, and as we talked about it, because she has been wise and not falling down, but picking herself up and going to the next place where she could learn and bring the, um, and the, the things that she had learned in all of these years being in the police work. Um, and that she's back, always has been in the city and always had her family here. So I'm glad to see that she's been, um, I guess it's called nominated at this point for the police chief because she is an excellent example for what we need to have more people that are working together to make a safe community with all kinds of diversity. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <coughs> Two? I got it. Oh, um, yes. Um, my name is Melvin Hicks. How you doing, Council? Um, I've been coming to this city a long time. And um, I done seen a lot of stuff. I done seen this council right here go to county council and stuff. Um, I done seen, um, I done seen much everything but this right here. Uh, I don't think Ms. O'Connor should be chief. Um, the process has been violated and the integrity of the, the process has been violated. So, um, shit, if I was, if I assault a, a Hillsborough County deputy, and drunk, I get, I'll be locked up right now. But you know, but the process has been violated. Um, the mayor violated the um, the process with with y'all and y'all um, legislators. So she's a legislator too. So she violated with the process and I'm doing that. Remember when Buckhorn said he, when he made um, um, Duggar chief, he called him on the phone and he wanted to be chief. <laughs> you remember that when Buckhorn said that? And uh, that was. The mayor did with her. Um, process being violated, buddy. Y'all all been here on the buckhorn. I remember y'all. Yep. All y'all been here on the buckhorn. Y'all you know, know the process being violated. It's the first time a confirmation been like this for a police chief. So um, we know the, the process being violated right now. The integrity being violated. So um, she she don't fit the category. Um, Tampa need to heal. Um, you can't have her with baggage coming to the police force there. She, Captain, <laughs> come on, uh, that's baggage for the city. Well, um, 2020, she have told you that right there. That's bag. She, she baggage for the um, the look for the city right now. With the police department, remember, Jane Castro used to be a um, chief of police somewhere else, not just Tampa. Remember that? That's way back there. <laughs> um, but the integrity been violated, y'all know that. But she don't supposed to be chief. Or she don't supposed to be, no, not her. But that is me. I've been here for a while. Ever since the, the Quiznos um, was right there by the police department, then um, um, five guys. Yeah, I've been here for a while. So um, I know how her, um, remember, the housing, um, the eviction process, and Jane cast the issue on the biking. She had to resign. Then she mayor is her poli politics for the police department. She's running the, um, the mayor office then the police department. Come on, now we hired her. No, no, we elected her mayor. 
not police or um, police. <laughs> we elected her mayor. How many hats you wearing? Yeah. For real. The mayor violated. We need to rein her in. Y'all need to y'all need to separate. For real. It's appalling. Number twenty. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Thank oh. you, sir. Thank <laughs> you, sir. Number three. I'm here to speak about the... You state your name, sir? Yes, I'm James Graham. Okay, I'm here to state something about the new alleged police chief coming up or whatever. Okay, imagine running out of gas, going to your house after helping somebody that was stranded. Then you run out of gas and you have a gun in your vehicle, legally concealed, everything properly contained, but you get arrested for it. You get one day in the county jail, time served, here's your gun back. You can't get a job. You can't get a job as a detention deputy, nothing. Didn't do anything wrong, just ran out of thing. Still have the gun, that's me. Another thing I wanna bring up, you all talk about reparations and doing good and making things right. 45 years ago, 1977, Tampa Stadium, Led Zeppelin riot. That's me laying in the field with my sister standing over there. Looking at the paper clips, it's funny. There was one youth that stayed in the hospital overnight. When I looked at the paper, I identified the cop that beat me up. I said he looked like a bulldog in his helmet. He's dead now. His name was Larry Vincent. Okay. I stayed in the hospital. I got my arm and back broken. I still talked to the doctor that took care of me 45 years ago at the VA hospital. So this is funny. I want reparations. So y'all get with me. Y'all want a card? I'll give you a card and phone number. But if you don't want to, because see, I'm also a photographer. And I've been Charlie at the Blue Collar Comedy Tour and a few other people. I've been around. I've been to some of your interesting little get-togethers. I've got photos. I'm going to start writing a book. Also, the federal government, they're sweating bullets right now, too, because I'm a veteran that doesn't exist. I'm a veteran that doesn't have any records, no tattoos. I'm not even in my stupid little yearbook that I call it from basic training. I had a blemish on my face. I found out why I wasn't photoed very often, if at all, in there later. I did rich people in government dirty work. So that's me. I was the only person, a 16-year-old boy, trying to help my sister up. And I remember, would you like to, here, I'll just phrase it. Get up, you effing hippie, when I was yanked from behind. Then I talked to a guy at the fair the other day getting a poster of the Led Zeppelin concert thing. I got my ass kicked at Led Zeppelin for $10. Anyhow, this thing right here, you know, I'm confronting issues from the past because everybody's getting so disappointed and helped out here. I wish the candidate the best. That's up to you. But, you know, people earn respect and trust and stuff. So I don't know where that's going to go exactly. So I would like to be able to, I know a lot of honorable and respectable and cops with integrity, and they know I've got their back. They know if they're being shot at, I'd be shooting back at the people with them that are shooting. If they needed some help, I'd help them. But you know what? There's going to come a time where I'm going to sit there and think it's not my job. It's not my obligation to help. Thank you, Mr. James. Thank you, sir. So nobody wants a card? That's good, because you will be hearing things in the very near future. I've been writing things. Thank you, sir. So it's going to be good. Thank you for your have comments. A great day. Pardon me while I put this out on you. You'll have a nice day now. Number four. Good morning. Good morning. Good How are you? you? My name is Brenda Canino. I'm a former city of Tampa police officer, and I did patrol the streets of Tampa with Chief O'Connor many years. She knows the city. She knows its people. And it's my understanding that the recent appointment of Chief O'Connor by Mayor Jane Castor has apparently created a whirlwind of rumor and doubt as to who exactly Chief O'Connor is. 
questions of her credibility, other forms of reasonable doubt, are not unusual for any situation regarding government appointed positions or even formal elections of certain officials. Criticism of character, however, as well as other forms of prejudice, slander, and so forth are unfortunately not indicative of so-called transparent and progressive organizations such as the city of Tampa. Sadly, it is a more repressive nature. I, for one, can attest to the caliber of Chief O'Connor as a policewoman, a mother, a wife, and a friend, and most importantly, as a backup in the city of Tampa. We, well, I was part of the per personality that protected the people in this community. And our main concern is the protection of everybody in the city of Tampa, something that's at a critical point at this time. I am here to briefly explain why I believe she is more qualified for the position and why all the speculators should take seat, take note, and reevaluate re your opinions. First and foremost, her dedication to the job as well as her peers and family have always been evident while working in the line of duty. She is fearless in the face of adversity and her resilience has always managed to move me as an individual. Chief O'Connor is extremely dedicated to what she does. Chief O'Connor is an exemplary in all these values. In addition to being a strong Hispanic female who is beyond educated, fully capable of being chief for the city of Tampa Police. I would highly advise anyone who is either in doubt of Chief O'Connor or who has any predetermined nations about her to take serious inventory, self-inventory of yourself before passing any further judgment. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Number five. Morning, Council. My name is Brett Bartlett. I'm retired from Tampa Police. I was there almost 32 years. Uh, I rose through the ranks from patrolman up to captain when I retired. I commanded uh, uh, a sector in D3 when D D3 is brand new. And it was a very challenging time, very good time. I command Internal Affairs Bureau, uh, Major Crimes Bureau, Administrative Bureau. <clears throat> so I had a very, very good, varied career. Having said that, as an officer, I had what you'd call a splotchy disciplinary history. And I had some rough times. And I was fortunate in that my leadership recognized, how they recognized, my ability to continue to serve and maybe do a good job. And I benefited from that. So I'm a big believer in second chances. And I've worked with Mary O'Connor. I know that she's a person of integrity, enthusiasm. I think she's going to do a great job. So I rise today in support of Chief O'Connor. And I rise today in support of Mayor Kasser's ability and decision to appoint whoever she thinks necessary to help her achieve the goals that we want in this city to achieve. So my hat's off to Chief O'Connor. I wish her the best of luck. And I, I again, I, I rise in support of this decision and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Brett. Number six, FBO. Good morning, Council. It's a pleasure. First thing, thank you each for what you do for each of our districts on a daily basis. My name is Rafael Pizano, for the record, P-I-Z-A-N-O. I am a liaison for the Mayor's Hispanic Advisory Council, which has served nearly 30 years for the city of Tampa. Our council personally met with Police Chief Mary O'Connor. We had a real human experience. Uh, I think first thing we noticed post that meeting is our city is blessed. We have more than one candidate, and they both 
or if there was a third considered, have an incredible history and dedication to the city. And we value that equally, and we respect that and admire that, their sacrifice and their labor of love in the city of Tampa. Uh, the conclusion of the board was that the experience that Chief O'Connor can offer the city, uh, her 22 years experience, her five years traveling across the country, her work with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, it can bring a lot of light to our city, and it's welcome, it's embraced, and we would support this nomination. That is my part today as a liaison for the council. Now I will speak as Rafael Pizano, prior service veteran, uh, loving member of my community. My personal words are that I see an individual that sacrificed, because law enforcement officers do sacrifice quite a bit. They put their life on the line. Their families endure quite a bit. I met a human being the day that our council met and I spoke one-on-one -on -one with her. I see someone that went above and beyond. And I notice that we live in a, a society where we watch movies or we read philosophy or we have our beliefs in second chances, but yet we stone in reality people for any experience where they learn from. I see one minute thing about this human being and I see how they created so much light and positive for their community and for their country. I've read, I've researched, I've seen the work abroad, and I personally feel as a, as a resident, I consider myself a son of Tampa, we each love this city so much, I see this individual, which I do not personally know, as someone who brings a, a certain experience where in the past I would have not considered. The encounter, that elephant in the room we all know about, that she encountered in her youth, she offers an experience that she understands multiple angles of thought when it comes to policing. She knows what it feels like to endure a certain character or a certain individual. She'll understand our residents. She understands policing and she understands our community. Again, I wish both her and the other candidates, uh, I thank them for their service to our community. I support Chief Mary uh, O'Connor for City of Tampa Police. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Uh, number seven. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, Boy. Connie Burton. I usually formulate my thoughts after I've heard a word of wisdom. But what was given to us this morning was a solid meditation of what about the people? What about the people when we think about what's happening throughout the world? And I immediately reflected upon what about the people that have had to live up under racial profiling, not in a faraway country, but right here in this city. What about the people that has expected the leadership to start from a place of, with a clean broom so we can get on a fresh start? When we look at what has happened throughout this history of policing in the city of Tampa, People can't be proud of that. It's not of one person that we are looking at. We are looking at the whole department, the leadership of the department that thought it was all right to engage in racial profiling, that thought it was all right for officers to receive promotions based on the number of arrests they made in minority communities. The fact that we had driving and biking while black is not something that we made up. And then when we hear about people receiving this um, second chance, a redemption, we don't see how broad it goes. We just hear for one person, for right now. But nobody has came back to the community that was harmed the most. I'm not talking about the feds coming in here, but I'm talking about the leadership of this city coming in and saying, Harm was done to the African community. Harm was done to generational people when people was captains or rather they were just mere officers. And now those same persons are being asked to take the next level when they haven't repaired the damage. How do you continue to move forward with the, of this type of imbalance in this city? Tampa cannot heal until you first admit something was done wrong, not to that one individual, but to an entire community of people that was used as a stepstone for others to benefit. 
And we all know it happened. And so while people want to repair the damage, it cannot be done until we have total, total repair for those that was harmed first. And when we get that, then we can move on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burgess. Number eight. Mentez not. Tom Brady must be experiencing financial difficulties. What a poor example for young people and a poor example for people in general, but a good example of exactly how capitalism drains everything out of the working class with no consideration for the welfare or the well being of the worker. It should be called the Muhammad Ali syndrome. Tom Brady an elderly man, 15 years beyond retirement age, actively participating in a gladiator body injury, head injury sport, and the people we trust in society to know better and do better are all cheering him on. It is no difference from pedophiles enticing and exploiting little children with candy and video games as they're sexually abused. No difference from human predators enticing and exploiting teenagers with dreams of stardom, rap careers, singing careers, riches, and worldwide travel as they too are primed and prepared for prostitution, drug running, human trafficking, and all forms of degrading exploitation. This city council should not allow a process to work backwards. This city council should send a strong message to this mayor and future mayors that they're elected by the people to speak for the people and to serve the people. And no mayor should be allowed to arrogantly, intentionally, or haphazardly bypass the processes the people have disregarded then is allowed mayoral repentance because they were exposed by the media. Bypassing the city, the citizens, and the city council have grave consequences. And one of those consequences have already revealed, been revealed with the tragic death of a 44-year-old citizen that was a direct collateral damage of ignorant policies and disrespect for citizens in the city council. Property crimes such as a stolen automobile should not be prioritized or classified as crimes that could potentially lead to the death of sentence of innocent citizens. Chasing an automobile from MLK and 22nd Street in Tampa, Florida, to MLK and Turkey Creek Road in Sefna, Florida, or approximately 18 miles is not only irresponsible, it is criminal. Both the occupants of the auto, the police officers that chase the auto, the police chief, and the mayor should be held criminally accountable and criminally responsible. Leaving out reparations and making racist statements connecting criminal activity or criminal reform to faith-based organizations shows a great deal of racial insensitivity. The same way city councilman John Denkfelder was forced to resign is the same way the citizens and county government should demand the termination or resignation of Chief Judge Ronald Figueroa for corruption and mismanagement connected to Judge Carl Henson. It's the same way that this city of Tampa City Council should let the mayor know with a strong no vote that even in a technologically advanced society, you cannot put the cart before the horse. Citizens expect accountability. Accountability for gas prices, inflation, $108 million government spending, bicycle stops, gentrification, rising crime rate, the environment, housing crisis, runaway rent increases, and accountability for adhering to policy. It isn't about Mary O'Connor or the luck of the Irish. It's about the process and accountability. This city council should vote no. Thank you, sir. Number nine. Good morning, City Council. Yvette Lewis, president of the NAACP Hillsborough County Branch. Tampa City Council, could someone please answer the question, where was the transparency in this process of selecting a chief of police? Where was the community involvement and engagement in selecting the chief of police? I don't understand how the city of Tampa, taxpayer, uh, City of Tampa paid for a nationwide search with taxpayers' dollars and end up with three people in our own state, two in Tampa. Tampa City Council, you will make a difficult decision today. The mayor appointed Mary O'Connor for chief of police. Mary, Mary O'Connor stated at the press conference 
we can't, we, can, uh, we can't arrest our way out of crime. She also stated, stated that uh, she treated everybody with dignity and respect, but yet African Americans in this community was targeted with ticketing and arrest for riding a bike under Mary O'Connor's leadership. Tampa, Tampa City Council, you asked why we keep bringing biking while black up. It's because the wounds are still there. The wounds are still present. Later, to discover more wounds were open, slash with the crime-free housing program, targeted African Americans and poor people in the city of Tampa. You see, a lot of people lost their jobs, their housing, and most important, they lost their dignity. Since Tampa believes in second chances, maybe they will reach back and remove and correct some of the injustices that was placed upon the African American community. This process was flawed and needs to start over in order to build the trust in the community. After all, Tampa is a diverse city known as Champa Bay. Oh, I forgot, Tampa City Council. Could someone please question the good old boy network at TPD and ask them how they allow a person to advance her career after receiving a battery on a police officer? You see, we fight a lot of cases dealing with youth in the schools when you brush up against a police officer, battery on a police officer. Mm -hmm. We fight to end those cases to erase them because it stays on their records. So all I'm saying is consider what Thank the you, community is saying. Number 10. Gentlemen, thank you for the privilege of uh, addressing you. Richard, Father Richard Fellows, chaplain for the Tampa Police Department, one of the chaplains. I rise in support uh, for Mary O'Connor. I've known her for the past 15 years from the time she was, I think, a lieutenant back when I came in, way back then. And I've known her to be um, a woman of integrity, a woman of compassion. And I can also speak not only for the command staff that you see behind me, but also for the officers on the street, because I spend most of my time with them. And uh, to a person, they have all uh, said what a wonderful choice it was and how they look forward to working for her. They feel supported by her. They feel uh, empowered by her. And they support her 100%. So I rise in favor of her appointment. Thank you. Thank you, Chef. Thank you, sir. Number 11. Good morning, Council. Pete Brevy. Um, as I always say, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I think that it's uh, very important that I share a few words about the uh, confirmation of uh, Chief O'Connor. You know, I'm not political in nature by any stretch of the imagination, and it's kind of outside of my box to even kind of do this thing. But ever since Mayor, o uh, uh, Mayor Castor appointed Chief O'Connor as the police chief for the city of Tampa, there's just been a lot of discourse, and I just felt there was my obligation that I would come and share a few of my own comments. You know, I think that it's unfortunately, especially for the hardworking men and women of the Tampa Police Department and the community uh, as a whole, that this situation isn't about the qualifications of, of Mary O'Connor, um, nor any of the finalists, it's, nor is it involving really about the incident that happened with Mary 27, 28 years ago. It's really about the process, and I think everybody understands, everybody has a varied opinion on that. Um, Unfortunately, I don't think that that's one of those things that should lay at the feet of Mary O'Connor. She's not part of that process. She was a candidate in that process, and I don't think that by any stretch of the imagination, Mary should be the baby that gets thrown out with the bathwater. Um, being an alumni of this very department, I spent 30 years, and I'm still a reserve police officer, and I've been so for another seven. Um, you know, I have a I have a deep regard for this department. I think it's one of the finest departments in the country. 
It's my opinion that the controversy and delay surrounding this confirmation is damaging to a department of this size and its community. Um, I think in, in, in the time that we're all in now throughout the world, not only the world, but the, the country and locally as a, as a whole, I just think that we have a lot of issues that uh, need the attention of the police department. Um, you know, the police department's confronted daily with challenges and issues that require strong leadership. Um, and I said, not only is it the best interest of the department and the dedicated men and women that TBD deserve to have a singular voice and a strong advocate to speak up for them, um, as are the citizens, they deserve the same. You know, one thing that's interesting is that I've never heard one argument concerning Chief O'Connor's lack of ability, qualifications, or ability to lead the department forward. And I said, really, when I thought about it, it's because there really are none. You know, since the moment that she was put into a leadership position 20-something years ago, that's never been a question. You know, she is a very dedicated, forward-thinking, innovative, and extremely loyal leader. Um, and she made a, the, the best of a second chance, you know. And I believe for the good of the community and the police department, the time has come for everybody to unify and put this issue to bed and confirm Chief O'Connor. Doing so will allow her and her command staff to move forward and confront the myriad of challenges that affect the community while providing a safe city that we're all proud to call home. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Pete. Twelve. Good morning, my name is Stephanie Paleo. I retired in 2019 from the Tampa Police Department Homicide Squad, and I'm here to share with you why Chief Mary O'Connor is the best choice for chief. Although I'm not a resident of the city, I did grow up in Northwest Hillsborough County. I went to school and attended church in Forest Hills. When I was hired, it was my desire to work in District 2 in the area where I grew up. In late 2009, I was promoted to detective and assigned to the District 2 Latent Investigation Squad, where Mary was the sergeant. During this time, I very quickly learned that she held her detectives to a high standard. She always emphasized that we were there to work for the victims of crime and to provide them the best and most thorough investigation. She encouraged her detectives to work closely with officers on the street and also to think outside the box. Together, under her direction, our district was able to reduce crime. She always fostered camaraderie between members of our squad and had us keep outside interest and families a priority for our own wellness. Our squad was very close-knit, and to this day, many members are still in contact with each other. I later worked with Mary as my major when, she was, when I was assigned to the Violent Crime Squad. She and I have kept in touch over the years, and she often talks about the victims that our squads and the department in general have helped. I was re recently speaking with a member of our old squad. He reminded me that when we would talk about crime statistics, Mary always re reminded us that behind the numbers were actual people and victims that deserve justice. Above all, she has always emphasized that regardless of race, ethnicity, religious affiliation, or income status, that all victims deserve and will be treated with respect, and that citizens will receive the best police service that we could provide them. Like myself, Chief O'Connor has a true passion for this department and for police service. She, too, has a vested interest in this city. Chief O'Connor is the epitome of a mentor and a leader and cares deeply about people of this city. If this city council and the citizens want a better quality of life and reduce crime, she is, without a doubt, the best person for this position. Thank you. Thank you. Number 13. Gentlemen, so you know we have roughly uh, over 50 speakers. So you know. I, I have a list here, Mr. Shelby, so. Uh, well, good yes, morning, sir. City Council. My name is uh, Peter Wright. Uh, good morning, Chief, uh, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm not a politician by trade. I am a hotel general, general manager in Ybor City for a luxury hotel. I come to you today to provide some endorsement for Mary O'Connor. I'm a rebound citizen of Tampa, was here many years ago, and now back. But I can tell you, to give you some perspective, 
of the potential impact that Mary has on our city. I come, from, come to you from a perspective of a couple of things. One is I'm a steward of over 160 associates in Ybor City. I am the steward of thousands of guests at our hotels and restaurants. And I'm a steward of providing a positive impact of millions of dollars to the Tampa Bay economy. And that being said, when I met Mary O'Connor, being new to Tampa Bay, she came down and sat down with me and said, let's talk about the people. Let's talk about uh, what Ybor City is about and what we need to do. And a couple of things that stood out, and a couple of things that really stood out to me were one, was the health and welfare of the police department. And how do we improve the health and welfare of our uh, police department and retain police men and women? So retention is so important. Second is how do we develop community policing? How do we involve? And she also talked about not locking up and releasing and helping the mental wellness of those that need it in Ybor City. So I just want to come before you today and give my uh, recommendation and endorsement for City Council. Don't think my perspective comes from cities like Seattle. I was involved with CHOP, Houston, Texas, a diverse city, Charleston, South Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee. So I have been in those communities where I have seen new chiefs appointed and how we need to become more diversified. And I can tell you Mayor O'Connor is going to be the right person for the role. As City Council, please don't look at just straightforward not just at this, but look at a broader picture and see the potential impact that Mary can have for our city. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Number 14. Good morning. Um, my name is Brian Carpenter. Um, I became a Tampa police officer on the same day that Mary did. We were in the same class. Um, through my career, I had a variety of assignments, um, and I retired in 2018 after 25 years. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes to tell you uh, a couple things about Mary that may not be on her resume that um, you know I learned as I uh, came up. In 2007, I was promoted to a detective, and I was assigned to uh, Mary's um, DLIS squad. Uh, and uh, on day one, um, she made it clear that she expected us, um, her detectives, to go above and beyond to do that extra mile um, and um, to stay late whenever it was needed. Um, and uh, she also expected us um, to continue honing our skills and uh, different qualities. Um, one of those qualities um, was uh, communi communication and sharing information between our um, um, members of our district, um, not just um, with her, but also with our street uh, squads, our anti-crime squads, um, to provide them the information so that they could better um, focus on um, their efforts. Um, but she didn't stop there with the communication. She encouraged us and had us speak to our uh, patrol units who patrol our area, and then also with detectives in other areas. Um, uh, and um, she, she didn't let this fall to the wayside. This wasn't just something she said, hey, communicate with your people. Um, it was like on a daily basis, um, I would hear, hey, did you talk to your street crime squad today? Did you talk to your patrol officer today? Or she would ask the patrol units, hey, did your detective get with you? Have you been communicating? So that's a big thing. Um, next um, was something very important, um, was the compassion and empathy with victims. Um, being a crime victim is a traumatic experience. When someone breaks into your home or robs you at gunpoint, it creates fear and you feel violated. Um, Mary O'Connor made sure that we knew that and we were able to look at crimes from the point of view of the, of the victim. Um, she told us and wanted to make sure, and I remember this, um, um, that victim is somebody's um, relative. There's somebody's grandmother, grandfather, somebody's son, uh, somebody's daughter. Um, and um, she wanted us to uh, treat them 
as if that were our grandfather or grandmother or relative and, and look at it from that viewpoint. Um, through all this, Mary was able to get us, uh, our detectives, to follow a... Um, thank you, sir. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Number 15. Robert, rules of order. Mr. Clams Doss want to give me his three minutes. Can I get it? Please. No, sir. You don't, you, it's one minute. No, it's not. Well, no, no, actually, no, because there's no slip. There's no, it's, those are only during public hearing to yield the time. It's three minutes. Right. Up on the Robert rules of order, I can't get extra three minutes? Not per council's rules, no. You sure? Yes, sir. Can you <laughs> ask legal? Can you ask legal about this? Legal department. Okay, I'm wasting time. No, no. I'm going to have to talk fast. I got so much to cover. Okay. I just cannot see how in the world we can fault Chief Mayor O'Connor for everything. Bicycles, 1995. Spear Agnew went to prison, the vice president of Richard Nixon. John Mitchell went to prison, the attorney general. She never went to prison. We should give her an award because she stopped a thing called fraud in East Tampa. Six or seven million dollars going down the drain with the federal government didn't want to do anything. She came in and stopped it. Where people are using people's social securities and using people's name and getting money, fraud. We should give her a gold medal. And as far as the bicycles, she had nothing to do with the bicycles. She was not the chief. She was taking orders. When those bicycles ticket was going down, the, the Justice Department didn't tell you who they was what the ticket was about. They didn't go in detail about some of those people that broke in people's cars and stealing bicycles, robbing their own people. Quite naturally, you're going to get uh, tickets in a predominantly black neighborhood where black people stay because the population is 99% black. So quite naturally, you're going to write more tickets. But Mary O'Connor's not responsible for that. She's innocent, and she's qualified. And I'm going to say this right here. The same mankind, if a person is qualified to do a job, even if you don't like them, but they're qualified to make sure you're safe at night, to make sure your family can sleep at night, and to make sure this city is safe, you're going to go against a person because you don't like them and they qualify for a job? You're going to make, you're going to make the whole city suffer? The mayor know what she was doing when she appointed her because the mayor was once chief of police. She know. And Mr. Bennett was assistant chief. He know. They know who the most qualified person were. Because you don't like her, you're going to say, well, I'm not going to go. You're taking this person. I have nothing personally gained from this. I'm not a politician. I'm just a common man, 71-year-old man. Want things to go down right. This lady has suffered enough. We should pin a gold medal on her and the mayor both. Because they've done a tremendous good job. Mayor O'Connor needed to be the chief of police. And it wasn't easy for a lady, black or white, to be a police officer because men's always got promotion over them. I think she did a tremendous good job. So I highly, I highly recommend Mayor O'Connor. She don't need to suffer anymore. We need to put this city on the move and start fighting crimes and let this foolishness go and leave Mayor O'Connor alone so she can go to work and do her job. Fight crime. Thank you. Number 16. Good, good, good morning, Council Members. State your name, sir. My, my name is Clarence Dawson. I'm from the South Side of Tampa. We're North Tampa, Florida, on the South Side, way over yonder. And as I know, I don't know Mayor Connor that well. I don't know too many people that well. But and from, what, from what I've been watching here or hearing here, it kind of it amazed me. Because for one thing, it's people who do understand that she deserves what, 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 what uh, the mayor has given her or uh, applied for her. And I think for myself, from being from the south side of town, I think she is real qualified for this job as I sit down and listen and learn from what I'm from hearing what people are saying. 
you know, and I think, and I believe she is a person with integrity and more understanding of this county, of this town, Tampa, you know, and I sure appreciate it, but I do know from what I know, because I don't know her that well, but I can say she is qualified for this job. And that's all I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Number 17. If, if you've already spoken for public comment on this item, we ask you to exit so we can bring the other speakers that are downstairs up to speak. So if you've already spoken, we ask that you exit so the other speakers can come in and speak. Number 17. Good morning. My name is Julia Jackson, a retired educator of over 15 years here in Hillsborough County. Also part-time writer and photographer for the Florida Sentinel Bulletin. But I'm here today as a citizen of Tampa. 25 years ago, I met Chief O'Connor as a college student intern from Bethune-Cookman University, Mr. Orlando. Hey, hey. You're welcome. <laughs> as well as Mayor Castor welcomed me in. The two of them welcomed me in. Made it very helpful to me. Uh, it was a trying time during this time because uh, TPD was looking for African Americans. So I was put on the force as a recruiter, as a student from my own college. So it was very rewarding meeting and getting a chance to work in the trails of outstanding uh, officers. Now we seem to recamp 28 years ago of Chief O'Connor, which is very trivial compared to what is going on now in our city. In fact, it's not like she's brand new with TPD. You know, we have to let it go. Chief O'Connor has reconnected with the community. She has already put her boots on the ground, solving cold cases, not beginning, solving. She understands the Tampa challenges. I feel we should respect the pat decision of Mayor Castor. I'm asking you to let it go. I'm asking you to let's get it on. Let's start over. Let's get Tampa back in the groove of solving crime. Please, let's move forward and confirm Chief O'Connor. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Number 18. My name is Aubrey Pierce. Huh? State your name for us. Aubrey Pierce. All right. Um, I'm just here to just speak on behalf of Mary and just from a uh, citizen of Tampa on the east side, somebody who's been out here. I mean, I ain't proud to say I done been incarcerated several times, been to prison several times, but, you know, I, I believe that everybody deserves another shot. I, I've been not doing good, been clean. You know, everything I did, I did to myself. I, I used to fault the police and say this and say that, that they, I, it was, they was targeting me. But when you look at it, I've been out eight years. I ain't been in no trouble. I got a good job. You know, things was bad on the east side, like shooting, breaking in the house. Like, it ain't none of that right now. My mama walked to the store now, and we ain't got to worry about, you know, her getting mugged. She could go to the store. She go to the store now every day and, 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 and relax, sit on the porch. She ain't got to worry about gunshots, because we see the police now, it's more, it's more involvement now. They stopping, they asking questions, they trying to make sure everything all right, everything. So what she did in the past, everybody already knew that, so we, we should be beyond that. We should be done with that, because she, she already done took the, the blunt up from her own peers when she came back. So that's the, that's the worst pressure ever, trying to come back and look everybody in the face that they know you messed up. So. She she should came that so we should all look beyond that as 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 a, as a community as a, as a city we should look past that and just try to like make the, make make this right for us because I need I need somebody like her I was I was on the other side and I'm I'm rooting for somebody like her because I feel like now 
the city is a little safer on the east side, or at least where I'm at, it's a little safer. I see more police activity, and I, and, I, and I gratefully appreciate that, that my mom, my sister, my sons, they can walk out there, they can go outside and play, and we ain't got to worry about the gunshots. People get shot every day up there on 15th to 26th. Police was, was sitting there, like, letting them party out. Now, you got to keep it moving. It's, not, it's nothing going on here for you to be here. You don't even live here, but you here causing the disturbance in this side of town got the crime rate up. Nothing was going on till now. So I appreciate it. You know what I'm saying? I ain't no poly. I, ain't no, I just appreciate what's going on for my city at this point in time. Since she been in appointed or elected or whatever, you know. So I just thank y'all, you know, for letting thank me you. speak. Thank you. You gonna win, you all right. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is number 19. I have Yvette Flynn. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Good morning, city council members. My name is Yvette Flynn. I am a retired Hispanic police major from the Tampa Police Department. I served 21 years to this community. And during this time, I served with some of the finest men and women on this department. I have known and worked closely with Chief Select Mary O'Connor for the majority of my career. Chief O'Connor is intelligent, she is capable, and most importantly, she has a servant's heart. She will continue to build community relations which not only benefit the hardworking police officers and supervisors of the Tampa Police Department, but most importantly, all residents there of the city of Tampa, they have an inherent right to be heard, their concerns to be addressed as it pertains to public safety and their relationship with the men and women of the Tampa Police Department. I am honored today to select Mary O'Connor to support your status to chief for this department. And thank you so much for all the years you gave to this department and the dedication, not only to the officers, supervisors, officers like Ma'am, please, please speak in our direction because yes. of the, mi the, microphone, the microphone. Yes, of course, I'm sorry, I wanna apologize. I just wanted to make sure that she understood that we are honored to support her for police chief, and most importantly, that she is going to do a phenomenal job with the residents of the police department, as you have heard the members that are retired from the police department state her dedication and service to all residents of the city of Tampa. And I would like to thank each member on the city council for all you do for the city of Tampa. And thank you again for this time. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, while she's walking, may I say something really quick? Yes, sir. I, I just wanted to say, Yvette Flynn, that the uh, city of Tampa loves the Flynn family. And uh, you're always in our prayers. God bless you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Next up, we have uh, a living legend, Senator Arthenia Joyner. Good morning. My name is Arthenia Jorna, and I'm a lifetime resident of Hillsborough County, having served as your state representative and your state senator for 16 years in the Florida legislature. And I'm here today to support Chief Mary Elizabeth O'Connor, who was appointed last month by Mayor Castor, and is here today for confirmation by this august body. Throughout my lifetime, I have learned that courage takes many forms. It's the stuff we see when a police officer rolls out on patrol with no guarantee that he or she will return alive or places their body between a bullet and a civilian in a firefight or rushes toward danger, not the other direction. But it is also courage when a man or a woman lays bare the path they traveled to achieve today's successes and the challenges they overcame to get where they are today. 
For all of these reasons and more, Chief O'Connor is one courageous woman. Were it not for second chances, I would have had a difficult time, if not impossible, rising to the many positions that I've had the honor of achieving. I was arrested twice when I was in college, and my second arrest resulted in a 90-day sentence and a fine of $500 for protesting segregation. I served two weeks in the Leon County Jail, and finally, the fine was paid pro rata, and I was released. Those two incarcerations could possibly have blocked my Florida bar admission, could have derailed my legal career, and hampered any future political ambitions that I had. But the Florida bar understood the critical importance of second chances, something some people here appear to want to perpetually deny in order to block the confirmation of Chief O'Connor. Are those conducting this discrediting campaign so confident in their own past, their own pristine records, their own lack of any mistakes that they are willing to assault her credentials and undermine her confirmation? We have here today an outstanding woman of character, courage, and integrity. She has more than demonstrated her qualifications, her bravery, her love of the department, and the officers she commands. She has more than earned our respect, and she deserves her confirmation. So in closing, I ask of you, as we are asked in the Bible, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Good morning. My name is Dale Pritcher. I'm a retired City of Tampa Police Detective Sergeant. Uh, I want to say hello to Mr. Goods up there. <laughs> it's been a long time. Uh, in my career, I was a, 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 a sergeant. I worked primarily East Tampa. I also was an, uh, an academy instructor, and uh, one, of my, uh, one of the people I had the honor of instructing was Mr. Goods when he wore a younger man's clothes, so uh, it's good to see him again. Uh, I'm here today to very proudly support the nomination of Mary O'Connor to the position of chief. Uh, in my career, uh, as I said, I worked predominantly this, uh, a street position. However, the last five years, I chose a position as a supervisor in the Major Crimes Bureau of the Tampa Police Department. <clears throat> Primarily, I was the sergeant in charge of the robbery squad. In that, I also oversaw the Economic Crimes Unit. Mary was assigned as a detective to that unit. Uh, because of the dynamics, I had to have a second in command of that unit. I couldn't spend the time necessary to be a full-time supervisor for that unit. It was a very difficult decision. We had a flux of people leaving, senior people was a very tough decision, and I chose Mary O'Connor to be my second-in-command. It was tough because she was the junior detective of that unit. She had people that were 15 years senior to her, and I was going to choose her to oversee them. So when I talked to her about it, she was naturally a little uncomfortable about that. But she assimilated that responsibility in an amazing way. How did I choose Mary O'Connor? I take those 
decisions very seriously. I looked at every investigation she was involved in. I read every report that she was assigned. I assigned those reports to her. I saw every supplement that she did to every one of those investigations. I noticed that she contacted every victim of every crime she was assigned to investigate. Personally, she reached out to them. Also during that period of time, she initiated on, she initiated on her own some proactive plans to counteract crime in the community. As a leader on that unit. Give you two seconds, Dale, two seconds. As a leader on that unit, she was exemplary. She led those people. She did a great job. And I was really proud of that. When this nasty thing. Thank you for your, thank you for your comments. I got to cut you off, but thank you for your okay. comments, though. Your, I wanna, time, your time is I up. I want to do this real quick. I do it real I gave, quick. I gave, I, gave you, I gave you 10 extra seconds, Dale, so I, can't, I, have a move, I have to move on. But thank you for your coming. Next speaker, number 22. All right. I, I, I got to move on, Dale. I gave you a few extra seconds, so I have to move on. We have a, a certain rules here, so unfortunately, I have to move on. All right, I mentioned, I'll, I'll conclude. I mentioned that I'm a <laughs> retired. Have, I, I can't let you speak. Number 22, Kevin Howe. Okay, I thank Kevin you. Kevin Howe, thank you. Thank you. you. Please support Mary O'Connor's for Chief of Police. Good morning, Council. My name is Kevin Howell. Um, first of all, she's probably the hardest working person in this entire she room. She is. I think that's the accolade that really needs to go forward here. Council, I appreciate the opportunity to, to come here. I, too, as many people before, retired from the police department, but this isn't about me, what I did, or any, anything about that. It isn't about my history or, or really what anybody thinks of me. I know that this process is really too pointed the way I see it. This has been more of an attack on an individual, and it's about the fact that the council and the whole process, the process has been the problem. I would hope that it wasn't the person. In this situation, you, you've taken somebody that has an exemplary career. There is a spot on her record. There, there's no doubt about it. It's never been hidden. I think what you need to understand about that spot on the record is that many people sitting here today can never say that, that they haven't had something that's come up in their past. Something, no matter how minor or how major it was, as uh, this joiner had pointed out, that we have to learn from. Some of these are stories maybe we never got caught doing, but we'll share that with our closest confidants and maybe even laugh about it. But how many people can say that they were able to live through that, present that forward, learn from that, and then become a more stellar individual in the society. You've heard that from some of the other people here. I've had the honor with probably nearly every one of the officers that have spoken and retired to work with them, for them, beside them, train them, what have you, and every single one of them are just exemplary. I think highly of Butch. I think he's a wonderful individual, and I think he's a great cop too. Mary has brought to the table something that the city needs. It also brings to forward, listening to a lot of the city councils in the past, the chief is not going to come here and be argumentative with you. Somebody's not going to come here and yell at you, but actually work with you. And I think that's important to understand, too. You know, I, I wrote this wonderful thing, but I'm, I'm just not going to read it, because this is more about, again, the process and who the character is. My family lives in this, in this city. My, my family, my wife's family is embedded within the city for many, many years. Many of you on the council know many of the people that my family is well, well respected in this community as well. Um, but I want you to understand with Mary that one of the, the key parts here is that we, we, we learn from mistakes and that's been beaten up. But remember that the reason behind some of those mistakes is we learn from the lessons, but we don't know what drove them. We don't know the fact that, there, that a decision, a poor decision that was made months after an incident where she had to tell an officer that everything was going to be okay not believing in herself and i'm here today because i was that person 
And she was the one saying something that I don't know if she believed. But that, I believe, drove her to a point where she may have made a poor decision, but she has learned from that, and I, can, I would like to see that this council move forward. Thank you for your time. I thank appreciate you, uh, it. You all have a nice day. Thank you, Kevin. I, I don't, Council, I don't know if you guys know Kevin's story or not. Uh, I remember that night. John, you remember that night. You know, uh, I said thank God because Kevin really shouldn't be here, John. Kevin shouldn't be here. But him and Mike. But God chose for them to still be here with us. So I just want to say thank you for your service because that was one hell of a night. Kevin was shot, shot very badly. So was Mike. Mike needed this community so bad that to give blood because normally when you give blood, the hospital, at some point, they stop because they feel that the blood is, can be utilized for other people to save their lives. But this community came through for both these gentlemen and gave blood continuously so they could live. So I want, want you to recognize that uh, we appreciate your service, sir, and thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it, but it's more about the city and it's, it's, it's people, it's constituents and the people that we do this for. So really, the, the, the pleasure has been mine. Thank you, sir. So, All right, we'll move on. Number 23. Good morning, Council. Good morning, sir. My name is Simon Canassi. I am uh, the father of a first responder for Tampa Fire and Rescue, the president of the Friends of Tampa Firefighters, where I serve with uh, Chief Barbara Tripp, who, by the way, was appointed by Chief Jane, by Mayor Jane Castor, and it has been an incredible appointment. First and foremost, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come before you this morning to speak in support of Mary O'Connor. Most of, you, no, most of you know me very well and know two things about me. I love my city and I pull no punches. So let me begin by telling you that when Ruben Delgado did not get the appointment, I was extremely disappointed to say the least. The mayor knew of my disappointment and graciously reached out to me as a leader in the Hispanic community to justify her decision. I accepted it then as I do now because after all, she was once the chief of police and is well versed on what it takes to be the chief of police. So who am I to question it? Also, I reminded myself that our mayor was not just elected in 2019. It was a mandate. To the victor goes the spoils, gentlemen. There is no egregious reason not to confirm this appointment. I have heard about the lack of transparency in the process, and I ask you to look inward and ask yourselves if you would have questioned the process had Ruben Delgado gotten the appointment. I have heard about the incident in 1995, 28 years ago, between a 25-year-old young woman who had a momentary lapse in judgment but has since led an exemplary life as a law enforcement officer, a wife, and a mother. I judge people by the totality of their merits, not by an isolated incident, and I would hope this council does the same. A couple of weeks ago, I, along with other community leaders, had the opportunity to meet Mary O'Connor for lunch at Cachatori's and Sons on Armenia in the heart of the Hispanic District of West Tampa. She can tell you herself <clears throat> that we pulled no punches. Her responses were forthright and we found her quite engaging. We also felt that this was a person ready to lead. I believe 100% that I speak for everyone that day that she has our full support. And if you read yesterday's editorial in the Tampa Bay Times, they also encourage and endorse her confirmation. I firmly believe that Ruben Delgado will be standing before you someday for his confirmation. He is a class act and worthy. But that day is not today. Today, it's about Mary O'Connor, ironically enough, on St. Patrick's Day. Gentlemen, this has become a game of chess, and we simply do not have time for that. We have a police department that needs its leadership in place. I have witnessed each and every one of you in the past exercise statesmanship over politics on numerous issues before you, and I commend you for that and for your service to our city. This is a moment for statesmanship. Statesmanship tells you to always do what is decent because although it may not necessarily be the right thing to do, it is never the wrong thing to do. And luckily for you in this case, it is both the right and decent thing to do. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Number 24. Good morning, Council. Brian D. Fry. As I have the privilege of knowing many of you, you know that I am a neighborhood and community leader. 
I also have the privilege and honor of knowing so many of these wonderful folks from the Tampa Police Department behind me. I was as disappointed that um, Butch Delgado did not, um, wasn't appointed, but I will, I will say this. My admiration and respect for him, for Lee Burkaw, for Major Mike Stout, and for the entire Tampa Police Department in their determination to do what they do and do so well for our city is unwavering. I don't have any witty anecdotes to share about uh, Mary O'Connor, but I did read a lot about this lady, and I do know that she was the detective sergeant in District 2, which is where I live, in, our, in arguably probably the largest reduction in violent crime in our city's history. I know that she is an advocate for victims of violent crime and victims of crime, period. My interaction with Mary, actually, the first time was this past Saturday when our city had the wonderful forethought to host a neighborhood retreat of all neighborhood leaders in the city of Tampa. It was an honorable time to be all together, and Mary, thankfully, was the last person that took us from that meeting um, um, out, of, out back into our city, and what a way to finish such a wonderful meeting with someone who truly showed her passion and who truly showed how dedicated that she is uh, to our city. And I can tell you that every single person in that room, um, I would like to think, thought the very same thing that I did. Our city, our nation, our world has been riddled with um, divisiveness so much in these last two years and sometimes in these last few weeks. And now is not the time to continue that. Now is the time to affirm this lady who has risen in the ranks, both locally and nationally, and who has proven herself. Um, there is not a single person in this room that has not been given a second chance at somehow in their life. And I think what we do with those ch second chances is how we are judged for our future. And I think that there is no person better that has carried a, a torch or a baton in an Olympic race to do better of herself and for her city and for her world than Mary O'Connor. And I ask that God bless you in your decision. God bless our city and God bless our police department. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian. Number 25. <coughs> Morning, City Council. The last time I checked, the city attorney decision is final in the charter. The city attorney is just final. This reality check, legal opinion, don't matter. The lady is the chief. The name, please, sir. I'm a businessman. Thank you. Consultant engineer, chair of the West Tampa Sheriff. We, 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 we know you as Joe Robinson, but I need you to say it for the record, sir. Oh, Joe Robinson. Joseph William Jordan Robinson, to be exact. Joe Robinson, the FBI name. Uh, chair of the West Tampa Shire ACAC, uh, Vice Chair of the West Tampa CDC, Second Vice President of the NAACP, uh, taxpayer, past Grand Knight of the United Columbus Sacred Heart Catholic Church, and uh, Die Hard Iowa Hawk. And I can't wait till 3 o'clock to get to the game, and 12 o'clock I'm going to be celebrating my birthday at Ocean Prime with my daughter drinking Camus. Listen, Degato, thank you, man. West Tampa, we love you. Burko, we love you too. John Bennett, thanks for having lunch with me, man. Listen, let's move on. This thing's a dead horse. Y'all got an election to run. Y'all got one year to get back. You got to appoint a six, a, another person. I might put my name in. I'm telling you on TV now. <laughs> Keep it real. Okay, you need somebody to know what's going on. And I'm telling you right up front. You can't throw the baby out with the bath water. We're trying to do the same thing at Hannah. You're going to throw the baby out with the bath water. Guido, you see me at church every Sunday. Charlie, you know I'm on the west side. Vera, you know I'm by the down by and Joe Citro, come on, man. And Carson, come on, man. Y'all know I'm keeping it real now, because the FBI is riding here licking. <laughs> this lady got experience. She might save you. Right, John? <laughs> Listen, I hear all this here back. Brady back, man. Brady back. Brady back, man. Let's talk about that. Let's, let's move on from there. And the last thing, I got another minute. This is my birthday, man. Now you know I'm coming down on my birthday. I'm supposed to be talking about Hannah Avenue. You done moved that to the 31st. I'm, I'm fine with all that. I'll be back then, okay? But this is my birthday. I'm telling you how serious this is. See, I don't normally come down here. 
But I got my hat on and I'm ready to party after I leave here. So I'm going to be DWI, so then y'all pick me up now. But I just want to keep it real. And I want to keep it real. Remember this. The fortune favors the brave. And I've been telling y'all that. Fortune favors the brave. The old Roman statement. And uh, city council, be brave today. Don't play a haters. Y'all play a hating out there. Now I'm talking street to you now. Play a haters, keep playing hating. Okay, you got player haters out there. Okay, they don't know what's going on, but they want to be important. Okay, they want to be important. Get out here and do something, and you can get a Trailblazer Award, City Council. Okay, so what I'm saying is, let's be real. Let's cut all this nonsense out. But when I leave here, man, I'm finna hit it. Okay, and I probably wake up in the morning, you know, feeling it. And I want to thank the mayor, and I want to thank all our Irish. Because a lot of people don't know my grandfather was Scottish. And I'm going to leave it at that. And thank you for having him on my birthday, Mr. Gould. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. He still holds the record and track at Tampa Catholic. 9-8. Nine eight. Nine eight. <laughs> <laughs> Number 26. Hello. I am Sovereign Despot, King, Queen, King, Bubala, Johnny, America, Yahweh, Yahim, Sai, M. And yes, I am King Prince Harry's child. Now, let me explain this. What happened with Ukraine, the food's already been won. So, yeah, I had Russia pull out their troops. And, yeah, we bought their ass. I already gave them their damn one. I cried. Are you damn fucking right? We took care of their ass, too. Now, listen up. Today, we are reopening government. Ain't no city of Tampa government. This is Monsterville games, like we already told you. And the United States has been dissolved since 2011. And I already told you that she's chief of police, and y'all can't do nothing against it in the first third place. Because, you know, when I make a decision, it's final. And also, these grocery stores, I'm going to reopen them today. But listen up. Y'all going to learn how to work this bar tab. So I'm not opening no 114 trillion unlimited bar tab for y'all to sit there and try to figure out how to rob it. You're not going to be able to rob it. Let me tell you how a tab works. When someone buys something from your bar or your grocery store, you're going to mark it up. That's how you work a tab. No, you're not drawing any money off of it. It doesn't work that way. So, no, you cannot rob it. Tidy always trying to figure out how to rob stuff. Now, look. Those who didn't become willing volunteers, who wanted to become workers. Workers, you know you only get paid $3.47 an hour. Only the willing volunteer gets $800 an hour because that's their allowance paid in full and all of their stuff because they're the ones who decided to be true sovereign members. Now, you that decided to stay, you down with the state and don't give a darn, you the one who has finalized your decision at $3.47 an hour. Trump already told you, once I open the window, I'm going to leave it open for a little while, and then I'm going to close it. Now, it's not TPD, it's International Tampa Police Department Agency. Department goes for a clothing store. They don't work no, you don't see no clothes in there. And then company, that's CIA. <laughs> and I may explain the rest downstairs. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're <laughs> 27. Good morning, Council. Good morning, sir. <clears throat> name, it's an honor to be here, and thank you. My name is Scott Bullard. I'm a detective, retired detective from Tampa Police. I started my career in 1997, and in 2008, I had the opportunity to become a junior detective and work for Mary O'Connor. Uh, since I worked for her, I continued on and went to homicide, and then after I retired, I went to the Department of Justice, and I worked for the FBI for three years. Since then, I moved back to Tampa. When I worked for Mary in 2008 to 2011, I, heard, I learned that she had some exceptional leadership skills, two of which was the ability to communicate and her commitment to her work. 
when she communicated with us, she created this atmosphere of competition and teamwork. And you would think that that, that doesn't really match up, but she fostered this environment to where us as detectives, we communicated with officers on a regular basis. She encouraged us to speak and to teach one another and to learn how to solve crimes better. She also encouraged us to learn and train. She wanted us to better ourselves as detectives, as patrolmen. Training was on one of her top priorities. All of us wanted work all of the time and morale was high. We really enjoyed it. Other times I watched her communicate with management from other law enforcement agencies. The Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, the State Attorney's Office, FBI, ATF, U.S. Marshal Service. These communication skills solved cases. They recovered property. They lowered the crime rate. They helped victims. Her second leadership skill is commitment. She knew and memorized all the case details. She wouldn't leave a stone unturned. It didn't matter if the case was big or small. We wanted us to follow up on fingerprints, DNA, video surveillance, interview witnesses, interview neighborhood people, everybody, every lead county. <clears throat> she was always at work. She arrived early. She stayed late. She came in on the weekends, middle of the night, holidays, all the time. She's also committed to the community. She's attended several crime watch meetings. I've been with her. We've met with the mothers of missing children. We've visited victims to check on their welfare, their injuries, make sure the case was developing and progressing in a way that was acceptable. She's collected donations to replace Christmas gifts on Christmas for people that had their Christmas gifts stolen. It's important that you know that Mary O'Connor is a great leader. She has open lines of communication, and she's committed not only to the police, but also to the community. Mary O'Connor is a perfect candidate for chief police. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Number 28. Number 28. Number 28. We'll move on. I think they've crossed out some folks here. Uh, number 33? 33? I can't read that. Like Gonzalez, last name? All right. I didn't see Jarvis L. and me, so that's why I didn't call his name, but he was number 28. Sorry about that. Uh, good morning, gentlemen, city council, uh, to the mayor's office. Uh, if you're watching, uh, Ms. O'Connor as well. Um, I'm here to speak in opposition to the appointment of Ms. O'Connor. Your name, sir? Uh, Jutulio Gonzalez Militieri. Uh, I'm here to speak in opposition to, to Ms. O'Connor, um, not because of any concerns regarding the content of her character. Uh, I mean, nobody knows more about second chances than I do, so I, like, I, I, I'm a big proponent of that. But um, like, I, I don't know Ms. O'Connor personally, and it would be a fallacy on my part to judge her eligibility for the position. However, I'm opposing her appointment on the basis of the unilateral process that was used in the selection. I, I believe that was wrong. Um, while I do believe that the mayor's office ultimately does have the city's best interests at heart, um, given its checkered history, I would be, it would be remiss if I didn't question the uh, the mayor's office judgment, especially when it comes to choosing the next chief of police. And I say this because of the disgraceful tenure of former chief Brian Dugan and his inclination towards authoritarianism. I mean, it still stings the memory of people within this city, especially in the black and brown community. Um, that inclination is best illustrated by the disproportionate and biased response to the movement for black lives protests in 2020. His behavior encouraged bystanders to use vehicles as weapons and led to several citizens being physically harmed by the very police department, some of our neighbors, uh, to harm us instead of serving and protecting us. Um, during this time of necessary upheaval, um, where the legitimacy of our institutions are being called into question, I'm challenging the mayor's office to stand resolutely on the side of democracy. Let us get to know who these candidates are. 
If Ms. O'Connor is truly the best candidate, then let her qualifications speak for themselves as we measure them alongside the qualifications of the other candidates. The people of this city need hope, and it's up to the people in, uh, in leadership to inspire that hope. For that reason, I'm requesting that the mayor's office retract their unilateral appointment of Ms. O'Connor and instead opt for a more inclusive democratic process that includes the input of our city council and citizens of this great city. Also, thanks for coming back, Tom Brady. Thirty-four. Yes, my name is Karen Peoples, and I would like to say thank you for giving me this opportunity to come before you all and speak. I have no time to be a long, drawn-out conversation with you all. I'm going to get right to the point. My thing is, Mary O'Connell was selected by the mayor, but we also selected the mayor. I campaigned for the mayor. I worked hard for getting her in her position. So I say we have two people here, Mary O'Connell, Delgado, that will be very on um, leadership here. And I also say, let's move forward and let's go ahead on and do what we need to do but bring these people because I made president of Crime Watch Northeast in Tampa. And my thing is, is that she's going to be a part of my group in reference to helping me to do better in the city of Tampa. The city of Tampa is growing, and we need to grow with it. If there's a problems, and there have been problems, many problems, let's come to the table, all of us, and make a solution to the problem. And let's solve the problem by giving her an opportunity to be that person to help us solve the problem. I'm not here to badger anybody. I can't, and I'm not. But I am here to say, as a leader in the community of Tampa, I want to move forward. And I want to also say that Jane Castor, being the mayor of the city of Tampa, she has made her choice, and I'm going to back her choice. And if anyone don't care about or have a problem with what I say, see me later. But my thing is, I'm a grown woman. No one forced me to come here. I'm here on my own. But I'm asking you, we have no time to tally on and draw, draw out a long process in reference to what we need to do and move forward. Let us move forward in the right way. Let us all come to the, to the table, those who have problems. Yes, we have had a lot of problems in the black communities, but we need to solve these problems, not just keep drawing out with them. And I've said right now, thank you for this time. Mary O'Connell, I appreciate you. I appreciate Delgado. I appreciate City Council, but I also appreciate God for giving me the leadership to come here. Thank you, Ms. Peoples. Number 35. All right. All right, again, we have some exits here, so we'll jump to number 41. 41. Y'all must have scared everybody off. Lord, that's a big skip. Good morning, gentlemen. It's nice to be back in, in, um, in the house. Um, I stand here with a heavy heart this morning um, because of Councilman Dingfelder's resignation. We lost the body that we elected. The bullying of our local officials is sickening. On October 7, 2021, the city attorney, Gina Grimes, stated, if any city official fails to provide public records, the city cannot expect, expend taxpayer dollars to defend that position. It is alleged that I traded these emails. I'm here to tell you, no one ever asked me. And it didn't happen from Stephanie Pointer. <sighs> um, it's amazing because four days later, there was a lawsuit filed against one of our city councilmen. 
we opened up the floodgates. Councilman Dingfelder cannot serve us again for another five years. Yet, in Tuesday's Tampa Bay Business Journal, there was an article about an ethics violation. Article C-1-B of the ethics rules state that violations are not to be made public until after the case is closed. I ask you, gentlemen, who released those documents to the public? Because that's what the rules say. Um, this, um, this alleged ethics violation is not something new. Okay, this nonsense. I would say that it's a witch hunt. Why are we wasting our tax dollars chasing after somebody who's already gone? Um, as a member of the budget committee, I find it offensive. As a member of the budget committee, I want to re remind everyone that last fall, the budget committee recommended that city council be given more funds for staff. And these gentlemen and Councilman Dinkfelder selflessly turned down those funds. They said, no, we don't want you to spend any more money on us. And here they are without legal representation. I'd also offer that directors and officers insurance should be given to every single city official without cost to them. These gentlemen up here make $53,000 a year to do what they do. It's embarrassing that they have to resign or lose every dollar that they have due to frivolous lawsuits. Gentlemen, be careful out there. The piranhas are waiting on their next victim. Thank you, Ms. Bork. All right, number 42. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Carol Ann Bennett and I'm a lifelong resident of Tampa. A lot of citizens disagree with each other and want a lot of different things from their government. But one thing they all have in common is a zero tolerance for political games and power struggles on the taxpayer's dime. If city government is playing games and fighting with each other, they're not doing their job and they're wasting our money. If someone with deep pockets and financial motive threatens our elected officials for doing their job, for listening to the citizens, for representing us, if pro-citizen, pro-neighborhood, pro-safety councilmen are attacked for doing their job, the citizens want the city to defend that person, not hang them out to dry. Because in reality, the city is defending us and our right to have a voice and our right to a vote, and our right to a seat at the table. I can tell you what citizens hate. Regardless of political party or personal beliefs or priorities, we don't want our precious tax dollars spent to persecute and prosecute some petty violation of some obscure technicality that nobody knows about or cares about because we have real problems. We have big problems. We have a housing crisis putting people on the streets. We have a climate crisis that threatens our lives. We need safe neighborhoods. We need streets paved and sidewalks built and our trees protected and lots of good parks. What we do not need is our tax dollars spent reading thousands of emails about some meaningless violation that ultimately did not result in a financial benefit to anyone. That money could have been spent defending the people's right to be represented by their elected officials who were under attack for doing their job. We have big problems, real problems. When, cities, when citizens hear that city resources are being spent pursuing some penny ante BS, we are disgusted. So we citizens want everyone to knock it off. Leave your egos and your personal squabbles at the door and stop the self-indulgent games that are being played on the people's dime. We want our council members to feel safe to vote the way their conscience and their constitu constituents want them to vote without fear of financial ruin. Thank you. Thank you. Number 43. 
Good morning and thank you um, for allowing me to speak. My name is Dr. Stephen Schwartz. I am a long-term resident of the Channel District. I'm also currently vice president of the board of the Association of the Towers of Channelside. Um, I will um, be talking a little bit about the noise ordinance coming up later. Uh, first, I will quickly read a letter that I promised to read someone who could not be here. Uh, his name is Michael Leeds. My name is Michael Leeds, and I am resident of the Towers of Channelside and a former Channelside CAC board member. Thank you for allowing my neighbor and fellow board member, Stephen Schwartz, to read my testimony today as I needed it to be out of town for a meeting and unable to attend this, this hearing. I am writing this letter to show my support for passage of the previously approved Ordinance 2022-18. Sir, I'm sorry. Doctor? Hmm? I'm sorry, are you here on, is that item number 61, the yes, public sir. hearing that is set? Yes, sir. This is general public comment. You'll have that opportunity shortly. Okay. Thank you. I will talk later. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Uh, I just was told by my uh, administrative aide that Mr. Ka Mr. McCaskill went to the restroom. She, I just saw her come back in. Is she ready? Good afternoon, or is it morning? Good morning. It's been a long day. Good morning. Uh, my name is Keila McCaskill, taxpaying citizen, concerned citizen in Tampa. You know, this meeting started off, it was very ironic, it started off regarding process. Process. Something we hear you have to live by each and every day. You can't usurp your authority. You can't misuse it. You can't get exceptions. Yet, the administration has done that. That's why we all here today. It's not been a process that's been adhered to. So I'm, I'm asking, you know, it's unfortunate Councilman Dean Felder isn't here today because he, I believe the process violated even him and his rights as he defended this community, a very hard working city councilman, had to go through the process because he was a part of what they wanted to do and violate process. So this isn't about today dislike or like for this nominated chief. It's, it's none of that. It's about the disrespect and the failure to follow process. It's about the lack of trust in the community. It's about the lack of trust for the staff and the administration from the community. So not using your authority to say no today will hurt us even further. It'll be more, it'll be no separation of power. It'll, it could lead to more resignations, could lead to more Hannah Street oops. It could lead to force, forcing pure. It could lead to ignoring the greatest crisis we have in this city. Failure to say no, using your, your authority for process. And then I'm concerned, because I've never heard, and I've been here all my life, I've never heard of a felon being able to become a police officer. I'm not sure if that was recently adopted today or for the purposes of this recent request to nominate a felon. I have to call it what it is, it's a felon. I don't know one individual that was a citizen in this city that was able to apply and become an officer, let alone be elevated to its highest office. It's unacceptable. Not going through the process is unacceptable. We cannot accept that behavior from the administration. We can't do it, you can't do it, and all I'm asking for you to do is hear us, but respond as leaders today and say no. Thank you. All right. Number 50, uh, number 50? 51. Uh, 51? 50 here? Yeah. It, no, I, I'm going by the list, and then if there are other people to speak, I'll take those people after that. So, 51. Hi, my name is Valerie Bullock. I'm a third generation homeowner in East Tampa, and I'm not against the the person, it is the process that I'm against. Dealing with the mayor, it have been not transparent, and at times she lacks integrity, and I can back it up with facts. When she was trying to get people for the citizen advisory committee for dealing with the police complaints, she said if someone had been arrested, you could not be on that board. So here we is again. Do that just go for the citizens, certain citizens of Tampa, or do it go for all citizens of Tampa? 
and I'm also a wastewater supervisor for the city of Lakeland and an environmental trainer. I have been pushing for people out of my neighborhood to become wastewater operators to get the chance to get a six-figure income. Everywhere I go, the door is shut in my face. They are failing. They this, they that. So today, we throw out the red carpet for second chances. Is that just for the day? Is it just for certain people? Or is it for all people? And like everybody say, we all have made mistakes. Yes, we have. But why is it some people can overcome their mistake, but the people in my neighborhood in East Tampa, they get beat down with their mistake? That is it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm out of numbers now, so if you line up against the wall, if you want to speak, you can come up and state your name and make your uh, statements. We're out of numbers, so at this particular time, if you want to speak, just come up one at a time, and you're welcome to speak. Good morning, Council. My name is Shakina Berry, and I'm a proud mother of two boys, and uh, two boys ages seven and two months. I've been a Tampa resident for the last 30 years. Since March of 2020, I was exposed to COVID and got laid off, forcing me to apply for unemployment and financial assistance from different agencies. I received rental assistance through different agencies, but was hit with the backlash from my leasing company in mid-January of 2020 that I would not be able to renew my lease as a tenant because I had received too much rental assistance, which forced me to relocate my family in the middle of the school year. Since January, I have been actively looking and applying for different apartments with the constant worry if I would be able to locate one. If it's affordable within my budget, I want to live in a safe neighborhood and live in comfortably. Apartments are asking for $1,500 to $1,800 for a two-bed or three-bedroom apartment unit with no amenities, and you have to make three times the rent to qualify. I located an apartment rent, um, which rent was $1,595 a month for a two-bedroom, one bath with 895 square feet. I would, um, I would need to have a monthly income of $4,785 a month just to qualify with a, uh, with a rent to pay of $19 an hour and 40 hours a week. Bringing in a total of $2,680 a month after taxes, I don't qualify. I still have the cost of child care, electric, car payment, water, food. This is a crisis and we need rent stabilization not as the solution, but as part of the solution. Every community deserves justice on every block. This is my story, and again, this is a crisis. Rent is going up, but wages aren't. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Right, next speaker. Good morning, council. Morning. State my name today. is Rock. My name is Robin Lockett, and I'm switching the gears here a little bit around rent stabilization. Uh, rent stabilization is a must. We appreciate the $5 million, but that's just a drop in the bucket. This is a long-term issue that deserves long-term actions and policy changes. The community, des com the community deserves that. What happens next year when the money runs out? The rent will still be higher, and the wages will remain the same. This has been a crisis for the poor working uh, class, uh, working two and three jobs to make ends meet. Now that it's affecting others, it's identified as a crisis. Developers and development should not be the forefront uh, in making decisions. The people should be uh, uh, first. There is a need to protect all people. Profit does not vote, people do. So that's my uh, statement around rent, rent stabilization. What's going on here today around the uh, chief, uh, the, the appointment of the chief? I think that transparency is very important. That's very important. There's a process in place that's very important. And if I'm a citizen and I don't follow that process, I don't get a, uh, uh, I don't get a second chance. 
no one's diffuting or refuting the fact that the uh, appointed chief got a second chance, but in the black community, that doesn't happen. So to ask us to look at things from that standpoint is irrelevant because we don't get that second chan chance. Ask the people that's fighting uh, right now that have had uh, 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 charges that they can't get rid of and they can no longer get a job. They're su suffering. They can't even get an apartment. They're suffering. So things are held to a different standard. So I'm sorry that uh, 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 Councilman Dean Felder is no longer here, but and this uh, uh, area is packed with police officers. City of Tampa money sitting right here for two and three hours, right? So you do what your constituents want you to do. We, we, we elected you to do that. Thank you for your time. Anyone else to speak on the side? Anyone for public comment today? Anyone else? Come on, Miss Allen. Good morning. Thank you um, for letting me speak. I'm Sally C. Lee of the Volunteer Missionary Society. And I agree with everything that all the ladies have said, but that does not add anything to our community. Like I'm working to open a community resource center, the Volunteer Missionary Society. And I would also like to um, make an appointment to speak to you all about the Volunteer Missionary Society. Because stuff that makes a difference in our community, like Ms. Robin said, never get addressed. And we leaders that need second chances like myself. From 25 years ago, I'm a paralegal research specialist. I want to go back to law school. I only have two years left. But like she say, I can't get a job for 25 years. You know, it's awful. But I still volunteer, and I still learn every day what my community needs. And I want you all to meet with me and let me explain it to you so maybe you all will support a community center that can help people change their lives. So I forgot my speech this morning when God keeps you up all the time, you crane, everything. You know, he requires you to work hard for him. Whenever he calls, he expects you to get up and rise up and listen to what he has to say. And that's what I do. And this was a long journey when you can't get any money for anything. We all need second chances. We all been wild and rebellious somewhere in our lives. But still, I raised 12 kids successfully they all you know text and gone so it's me now and i want to accomplish this dream of openness to community center which would make a lot of difference even the, um the governor desantis when i wrote to him and i te i was telling him about the distraught that it brings to the young people with the elf cat you know and you don't even get a chance as a kid you get held back and it's awful. My granddaughter, she, she is so smart. And she said, Granny, will I ever make it to fourth grade? I say, I hope. I say, the elf can. So we need to remove the injustice and the blockage to our money for our community so that we can stand tall and be all we can be. And that's very important. And God is watching us and how we do things. And he's not very happy. And I thank you all for the time, and I would like to get a chance to speak to all of you all about the Volunteer Missionary Society Penny Fund. It will make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. to go. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning. I'm here to speak on, uh, my name is James Felton, Jr., I'm here to speak on, uh, I am a Tampa resident, and I believe that every, everyone should have a um, desire of uh, justice on every block in the community. I have seen my rent go up. Every year, I struggle to pay rent, and my landlord offered to help me. And I'm asking you all to help. 
She said that she was giving me, if I give her the keys, and then she would help me to find maybe another apartment, which she didn't. She collected my things and said I had one hour to move out. One hour. I gave her the both keys, and she said, when I gave her the both keys, she said, now where are your friends now? Where's the truck to come get you now? One hour. I was walking down the street that same day, and where to go, I was disabled. My I had nowhere to go. And so happening, I had $8 to order to get somewhere to the hotel, which one of the residents at, at our Walker House asked me, she said, well, if you give me the $8, I have an Uber to take you where you want to go. And I was thinking about how they never happened to me in my life. So I want to know is if, if you can do anything, and I know we all can have a second chance, to help the ones that really are struggling, because you don't know what kind of education they may have, or you don't know what God may have store for you. I had to depend on my family, which I have one family now. All my family is here, but it's just separation since the Seminole killer that my brother had got killed in. And um, because I only had it, and um, it's just uh, my brother, I stay with a relative, and sometimes I walk the street all night because he have his privacy and stuff, but it's just not having, like having your own thing by yourself, you know, to, uh, to help by living, because I used to be married, and I lost my wife nine years ago, and I'm just helping, just asking you all men up there, please help, not just me, all of us, because we all are equal, and we're looking forward to, for this to happen. Thank God for the mayor for $5 million. She should have gave me $1 million. I probably would have took her to lunch, so hey, but I just thank God that I'm here to say, please help us, please. It may not seem much, but it's a lot more than I'm not saying. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else for public comment? Is anyone on the second floor for public comment? All right. Yeah. I conclude public comment. Uh, Chief Bennett, will you, you have enough time for your presentation? It's going on uh, about maybe 20 minutes, or you be good? Thank you, Chairman. John Bennett, Chief of Staff. I think we can accommodate the presentation in less than right. 30 minutes, we'll, if we'll that's proceed. Council's pleasure. All right, we'll proceed then. Again, good morning, Chairman, Council, and Tampa community. <clears throat> Today we present Mary O'Connor by the way of a resolution for confirmation by City Council as prescribed. We have an important obligation today to state, sustain the agency's two-decade level of service that has lowered crime by 80% while reducing arrests by 74%, which outperforms all major jurisdictions in the state. We see by lowering crime, we lower arrests, and by lowering arrests, we create opportunity, and that opportunity leads to jobs, and those jobs lead to an increased quality of life. Mayor Castor's commitment to a national search and due diligence leading into Mary's appointment is followed by the prescribed process of presenting Mary to Council for confirmation. Mary was vetted by over 100 years of combined law enforcement experience and introduced and reintroduced to hundreds of community members leading to today. As the chairman has stated, and, and I can contest, the department that operates to this level as a paramilitary organization needs both dynamic and successive leadership to not only be the chief, but to sustain by preparing the next chief to take over one day. I'll leave you with this and then turn it over to Mary O'Connor for comments. And again, it is something that I think would resonate with the chairman, again, who has served in this public safety capacity. While many of us went through our initial academy, mine was actually almost 40 years ago, and training to become officers, we were told not to get emotionally involved in our job. Some of us over the last two decades realized that it is just the opposite of that, that we have to learn to care about the community and the police officers to make a difference. Mayor O'Connor embraces the caring of the officers in the community as the most qualified person to lead the Tampa Police Department through its next chapter of police community success and trust building. I thank you and now I'll turn it over to Mary. Good morning, Council. <clears throat> Today it's a great honor for me to come before you. I have been nominated to become the next Tampa Police Chief and I would be humbled if given this opportunity for your support and your confirmation. For me, law enforcement was a calling, not a job or a profession. 
and 28 years ago I was called to the city of Tampa to serve the citizens. I am not yet done serving. I deeply care about this city, the people that call it home, and the past five weeks have helped me strengthen existing relationships with those very members of this city that call it home. I have been fortunate to build new relationships also along the way. As representatives of our community members, it is critical for the police chief to work very closely with city council so that together we can ensure that the community has a voice in their police department and how it operates. Today we heard from many community members and they had several concerns. We need to continue to allow this community to have a voice at the table so we can work together to come up with some real solutions to problems. I'm committed to working closely with you to achieve our goals. As the next chief, I want to remain hyper-focused on my four priorities. Number one, I want to work side by side with all community members. Number two, I want to ensure that the Tampa Police Department officers have a very robust safety and wellness program available to them. Number three, I want to reduce violent crime, but I also want to reduce all crime. And number four, I believe in having a strong quality assurance platform in place to ensure everyone in this city is treated with dignity and respect that they deserve. As I've learned from my work with the Department of Justice and the FBI, it is critical that the police department not only solve crime, but identify the root causes of crime and work with our partners, including social services, to address those root causes. Not only does addressing the root causes prevent crime, it also eases the burden on our officers and provides families with the services and help that they so truly need. I am surrounded by a terrific team to lead the Tampa Police Department with Assistant Chiefs Lee Burkhoff and Butch Delgado. I very truly value Butch and all he has done to keep this agency moving forward as the interim chief. He will continue to play a critical role in the police department's leadership as we all work together to accomplish these goals. I have 22 years of experience moving up through the ranks at the Tampa Police Department. I retired as the assistant chief of police five years ago and in the last five years, I have learned and shared best practices in the law enforcement profession around the United States. I am very excited for the bright future of the Tampa Police Department and serving this community that I love, and I am grateful for this opportunity to be before you today. Thank you. All right, we'll take questions. Uh, we'll go uh, this way today. We'll go, we'll go Mr. Brent. you think so? I don't have any questions. I just want to say that the process that I've seen here today is uh, very democratic. You've had people from all sides of the community and uh, speak in their, how, how they felt personally. And that, that means a lot to all of us on this side of the dais. So all those that came up today, the 50-some, I appreciate you saying your, your facts on how you felt, whether it's for or against. And, and that's what the process is all about. This is not a political contest. And even in political contests, there are really no losers. Some get elected, and some never get enough votes. And if you look at the dais right here, you go back, and some of us got elected the first go. Some of us didn't get elected the first go. Some of us didn't get elected the second go. And some of us barely made it on the third go. So what I'm saying is the process that we go through is exactly almost like Indifference, don't get me wrong when I say that, it's the same thing as us. When, when you're a, a dedicated police officer, and we have many, I think that's why the city of Tampa has gone down immensely in crime year after year after year. One of the leaders in the whole country with respect, however, to the citizens. When you look at our position in life, 
Why are people moving here? Some people would say, well, it's about your sports. Maybe there are some that move here because of sports. But I would say that was very minimal. When you look at a city that has opportunities for growth, opportunities for jobs, we never had tech companies here. We never had much of anything. So you look back and you start realizing where were you when you started this process. And it goes back to the 70s with Mayor Pope. I've worked with five different mayors, and I've said it before. They all have different ideas. They all have different ways of doing things. They all have different personalities. But they have one thing in common. And that common bond is that when they leave the city, they want to leave it better than when they got it. So that competition to always step forward and make something better is not easy. Those mayors have always worked, whether we realize it or not, for the betterment of society. Downtown, a few years ago, was nothing. They had maybe 605 people living here. 600 or more in jail. The other five were looking a way to get in jail. When you look at Ybor City, Ybor City was not much either. Ybor City had three things. Not necessary in this order. Way back, not now. Drugs, prostitution, and tumbleweed. It wasn't until millions of dollars were invested in there to make things happen. There hadn't been a new building built in Ybor City in years. Now there's a new building in most places, going up at all times. When you look at downtown, how many tall buildings have come up? Lately, none for big, big buildings for commercial. But there was a lot of commercial buildings, square footage built in downtown in the last, the last 25 years, which didn't exist before. These are the things that when people come to visit, they stay, they like it. You see, we got rid of one squad. And that was a squad that put down the sidewalks and took them up at 5 o'clock in the evening because there was no one walking in them. Yep. Downtown was dead. Look at it now. You used to be able to leave this lot or any other lot without even looking because there was no cars traveling. Now you've got to be ultra careful. And the city has grown. Uh, it, it's become a better place to live. Why do people relocate here? I hate to tell them it's not for sports. Sports is not even in the top five. It's for opportunity, for education, for the quality of life, and let me get the hell out of the snow. So when you see, we only have two seasons in Tampa. That's summer and Christmas. And the people want like that when you're my age and older. People from New York, people from the New England states, Michigan, Ohio, they love to be here. So I want to say one thing. It's incumbent of us to understand the process, and I think we have. Uh, we've heard a lot from both sides, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Of course, you're the legend of this council. You've been around a long time, and I've also been under five mayors, so I, I, I know what you're talking about. Everybody's different. Mr. Vieira, you recognize. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And I appreciate, first, I wanted to say that I really appreciate everybody who's not just come out today but sent us emails and calls. Um, I, I've tried to be very engaging on all the inquiries because I've, I, and, and, I'm, and by the way, y'all, I'm just going to speak from the heart. I, I always try to speak from the heart, and I think we are here at City Council every day, but especially today, to not only speak from the heart, but to call balls and strikes. And if we tick off one side and the other, or maybe tick off both sides in calling balls and strikes, I think it's incumbent upon us to do that. Um, I, I thank everybody for, for reaching out. Uh, by email, by calls, uh, uh, different ways, et cetera. You know, I, I promised from the very beginning on this that I would be fair, that I would be reasonable, that I would apply <coughs> scrutiny, right, on, on, uh, on, on the record of, of Mrs. O'Connor, nominee uh, O'Connor, et cetera. And, and, I, and I've, I, I think I've done that. I think I've done that. One of the big things that I look at uh, when, when looking at this issue is a number of things, the welfare of our city, putting us on track, it's, it's no secret, and some of the comments have gone to this uh, today, we've had a lot of challenges. We've got to get on track. Also, something that some folks have talked about, the well-being of our first responders, in this case, Tampa Police Department, and our ability to fight crime, 
to engage the community, to support victims of crime, and get everything on track. For me, that's something that always has been very important. A lot of folks have talked about uh, Chief Delgado, a great man, a great man. The, the, the sentiments that were expressed, right, when the decision was made by the administration speak to what a great man he is. Um, I, I have made remarks in that regard uh, before. I, I think there's something that, that is, is not in dispute here and that I'm gonna say that I think the process, that a lot of folks have talked about the process, and I want to define what I mean by the process in a little bit, but that the process has in effect undermined, which is that we are dealing with a strong woman. We're dealing with a good woman who has dedicated almost a quarter century to Tampa Police Department, right? When I look at the, the, the record of Mary O'Connor, I'm the kind of person that I say thank you to, put who, to people who put their selves in harm's way whether it's the military, whether it's firefighters, or whether it's cops, we ought to say thank you. We ought to say thank you to Mary O'Connor for her service, 110%. I don't, I don't think that's in dispute. Um, it, it's a record that she should be proud of. I see her family here. It's a record that her son, her daughter, and her husband should be proud of, and I know that they are. Um, but we would also, uh, again, calling balls and strikes, there's the process. There's the process, and the response that we've seen from members of the community, right? Some of whom began with some more caustic uh, responses that have kind of come to the middle, speak to a process that was, I believe, mishandled. I believe it was mishandled, whether it's engaging with Tampa City Council on certain issues, whether it's challenges we saw in parts of West Tampa, et cetera. I think that process was mishandled, right? My position is that we can divorce that process, which has been mishand mishandled, which can, we can deal with through changes, right? There are legal changes that can happen, et cetera. There are lessons that can be learned from this that we should speak of. Again, I don't just mean lessons that can be learned behind closed doors. I mean lessons that have to be learned in public, right? But that we can distinguish between the process that has been clearly mishandled. And by the way, if, if if somebody says the process has not been mishandled, I would respectfully disagree. I think it has been, 110%. I think it has been. But that has no direct bearing on this woman's record or how we should react in that regard. Um, you know, a lot has been said about uh, Mrs. O'Connor, a uh, chief nominee O'Connor, uh, and, and her record. Um, I think we need to distinguish between the process and the very, very good record of this woman. I think there's a number of questions that we have to ask ourselves, which is number one, can we have a vote that acknowledges her remarkable career with TPD? Can we have a vote that respects her record, um, but doesn't necessarily call that record into task for the process that has been clearly mishandled? Um, I, I think that we should do that. Another big issue is, and I have 30 seconds, is de-escalation of what's been happening in the city of Tampa dealing with issues in a responsible, calm way, through reasonableness, through leadership, by being calm, et cetera. We can all, all six of us, working with the administration, can deal with the issues of the process responsibly. I want to be a part of that while not undermining, in effect, this woman's record. I think that's our challenge. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tito, you recognize? Mr. Chair, thank you very much. I have to discuss on so many levels uh, what is going on in front of us today. And I'm not going to be kind on some of them. The strongest person in this room, Butch Delgado. Butch, thank you for serving the people and the Tampa Police Department in the way you have done for all these years. And I'm hoping one day I'm sitting on this dais when your time comes. Thank you, my friend. In all the calls that I have received, and I'm sure that we have all received a lot of phone calls, a Caucasian woman said to me, Councilman Citro, my pick would have been Butch Delgado because he speaks Spanish. And the Spanish population in this city is rising faster than the other population. And that would have been a major asset for any chief of police for the city of Tampa. Ms. O'Connor, you and I had met 
on several times. And the second time we met, I was very harsh on you, and I tried to give you advice. First thing I said is, Mary, you need to step back. You need to regroup. <clears throat> you need to get reclassified. You need to go out into the community. You need to touch base with religious organizations. You need to touch base with all the chambers. You need to get to know the people in this city. Basically what you told me was no, I'm not going to do that. Mary, you have done the checklist. You have gone out to the community. You've gone to the clergy. You've gone to the, the neighborhood association. You've gone to the chambers. I gave you names and numbers. You're reinstated, classified. What's the message? Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm gathering more thoughts here. You have a stellar record, Ms. O'Connor. I've always been, and I've said this in the past, and there are many people in the audience, there are many people watching on TV that have heard me say this. I will always, always, always stand behind the Tampa Police Department as a whole. But the moment one officer steps out of line, now I'm going to turn Chief of Staff. There are so many people that should have been involved in this process, and I'm going to rattle off three or four right now. State Attorney, Public Defender, Sheriff's Office. Those are the people that she may have to work with on a daily, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. There's another person, too, the chairman of public safety. All these should have been involved in the process, in my humble opinion. And there is one more thing that I have to say. Something that is was the rudest comment I ever heard. How could seven men stand in the way of a woman being confirmed as Chief of Police? All these men up here on the dais confirmed three women as department heads. Chief Tripp, a woman of color, is now Chief of Fire Rescue. Sharisha right. Hill, a woman of color. Parks and Recreation. And I do believe I saw Miss Osea win. Miss Travis back there too. Nicole Travis. Miss Travis back there too. Nicole Travis. All women of color. So that statement offends me. And I hope it offends the rest of the Council members on this day. Ms. O'Connor, I wish you all the luck in the world. I want you to know that you have done the things that I asked you to do that you first refused, with the exception of stepping back. Mr. that's your time, sir. Mr. Thank Mr. you very much, Mr. Chair. You recognize it. Thank you very much. And thank you to my colleagues uh, thus far for their comments. May 5th, 2009, I was out with friends in Hyde Park, Cinco de Mayo. All of them were drinking. I was not drinking. And as I left, going up Howard Avenue, I ran a red light. Because of the traffic, I was either going to slam on my brakes and get rear-ended or just take the light. I took the light. Once I crossed Kennedy and approached Cypress, I was pulled over by TPD. The officer asked me to step out of the vehicle, asked me if I had been drinking. All I had was Diet Coke. That's what I drank at the time. I no longer drink soda. And... Uh, asked me to follow his finger. 
Then he asked me to walk a straight line. I guess it's what you call the sobriety test. Then he asked me, you know, did you take any medications? Have you gotten much sleep lately? And I said, I worked two jobs, and this was my first day off. I was out with friends. And he said, well, go home and get some sleep. However, what if the uh, officer decided to arrest me? Um, not a conviction, but an arrest on suspicion of whatever, DUI. I was already planning to run for city council uh, in 2011. This was a year before I filed. Had I been arrested, just an arrest, would I have been able to, uh, would I have even filed to run? Probably not, because I figured, you know, my future, who's going to take me seriously? And as a matter of fact, one of the newspapers in 2010, 2011, uh, looked back into candidates' past for city council to see who got arrested and whatnot. My name would have certainly been on that list. Uh, and the reason I say that is I wouldn't be sitting here today had the circumstances been different. I got elected in 2015 and I wanted a higher legislative aid. And it was blocked all the way to the top because that legislative aid had a DUI arrest. And as I understand it, a DUI is a, a misdemeanor, not a felony, I think. Uh, and they wouldn't let me hire this individual, which meant I was without an aide for months and I had to choose somebody else who was my aide for, for several years. I have a completely different aide now. Um, there's that. Somebody close to me not too long ago with the sheriff's office as a deputy got a DUI and was fired and appealed it all the way to, to the sheriff and was not given the job back and had to move out of town uh, and is no longer here. I have been here seven years and I have struggled with some votes. Some votes are easier than others. Uh, I think the most difficult vote was the stormwater vote from September 2016 because I got hell for that. that. But it was the right thing to do. This vote is probably the second most difficult vote I've had to take because of the overwhelming amount of people that have contacted my office by email, by phone. I go to, as was mentioned, Cacciatore. I go to get a salad, I get stopped. I go to get a cup of coffee, somebody stops me. I've had the most random individuals contact me that I've never met before to uh, discuss this issue with me. Something happened here in 1995. Uh, I've mentioned things in the past of other people in a situation that I was in that I didn't get in trouble for. I didn't, I didn't do anything. But still, circumstances could be different. When I struggle with the vote, I turn to God. I'm a person of faith, and I pray. Um, and I ask uh, other people their advice. What would you do? Uh, I believe in second chances, but again, not everybody gets a second chance. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at the circumstances with Chief O'Connor, who is standing before us, and what happened in 1995. But then you have to look at uh, her career afterwards. Uh, she was fired and then had her job reinstated, and the career after that, I mean, if you look at the personnel file, as some people have, I think it's, I don't think there's a blemish on it. Uh, you've had people come out uh, speaking in support that have worked uh, alongside her uh, in all capacities. Uh, we have used the word process uh, overwhelmingly today, and it's probably the most used word I've heard in the last month. The process is flawed. Um, I was there at the public forum uh, with the two out of three candidates. Chief Delgado was not there for family issues, and it's understandable. And I don't know, Chief Delg, I don't know you very well, sir. You're a nice guy. We've had two conversations, one on the phone and one in person. That's all I know. But the people of West Tampa love you and your family. I don't, I don't know them. But in everything that they've said, uh, your reputation speaks for itself. Nothing but positive things. Um, I went up to Mary O'Connor and said, you did a great job after that forum. What a nice touch at the end when you close it out. I went up to Mayor Castro and I said, Mary O'Connor, Mary O'Connor. I was here. I gave Chief O'Connor her commendation when she retired from TPD. I was one year in, and she was, and we have a great picture together. So I struggle with this vote because we have so many huge issues facing us. We have six council members up here. We have next week is going to be crazy. The week after is going to be crazy, and then we get to a point. Somebody almost done. So is it worth the battle to deny somebody? Is it worth it? And I've, I've thought about this obsessively, to have a 3-3 vote and see where it goes from there because we have six people now. I mean, you have to pick your battles. Do we like the process? No. Is everybody happy? No. Councilman Reyna has said in so many ways or so many words, you know, everybody leaves unhappy. Nobody leaves unhappy. Something like that. You know, I mean, 
Nobody wins, nobody loses. Uh, so again, you know, this is a very difficult vote because of the overwhelming amount of people that have reached out in all aspects. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, and I know we have one, a couple more people. Mr. Carlson, recognize? <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Um, I want to echo some of my colleagues' comments about the community. Thanks, everybody, for coming out today, um, especially for the, the, the friends of um, uh, Chief Nominee uh, O'Connor for coming out. Um, she, when we met a couple days ago, she said, are you okay? If, uh, it, it, do you think it would be in bad form if a bunch of my friends came? And I thought it was very informative, so I thank you for bringing them. Listening to somebody who's known you for 20 or 30 years is totally different than a, a lobbyist getting a business person who doesn't know you to come up here and say something. So I thought that was very valuable, so thanks to all of them. Um, I want to thank Butch Delgado also. He was great to work with, and he's very popular. Um, most importantly, he helped us get rid of the racist policy from the last administration, uh, renting while black, and we brought that in for a landing. And when I, I've sat down with uh, uh, Chief Nominee O'Connor a couple times, we had great conversations. I'm very impressed with you, very impressed with your background. And, um, and she committed to, to being focused on civil rights and to continuing to end those racist policies from the last administration. One was biking while black, renting while black, and there are others. And we all know what they are, and we cannot go forward, this community cannot succeed uh, if we have uh, racial oppression. And if you wanna see the economic impact of it, go to tampascorecard.com and you'll see that uh, in the last 10 years during the biggest economic boom in American history, Tampa failed economically, if you look at the census data. I wanna uh, welcome, I think uh, Ms. O'Connor's kids are here, I want to welcome them. I made a commitment to her in the beginning. Um, I don't have anything bad to say about her anyway, but I said, I'm not saying anything bad about you because I know your kids are reading the paper. Uh, my kids also read it, and uh, this administration has leaked information about me that's caused me to have uh, misleading stories about me. And so I know that pain, and I'm not going to do that to you. I would not do that to you. If I have a dispute with you in the future, I'm going to call you and have a conversation with you about it. Um, uh, other members here have read negative news that the administration has leaked as well, including our former council member, Dingfelder, who had some, the staff leak something on Monday after he was no longer a city council member. I think that's despicable. Um, today, I think it, 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 we have a great candidate, but I have to set that aside and, and talk about process. And really, it's not just process, it's about democracy. Democracy is at risk in this city. And most of the calls I'm getting are not about the candidate, it's about protecting democracy in this city. The process was not transparent, it was disrespectful, not just of council, especially disrespectful of council, but it was disrespectful of the public. And in our meeting a few weeks ago, we said that, we gave feedback, because we didn't have a, anybody in particular that we wanted to pick. And you would think that the next response would be that the mayor would call each of us and say, you know, we apologize, we're gonna change the process, what can we do better? I don't know about my colleagues, I didn't get a call. Instead, what we heard was that there was a political campaign, not a public information campaign, not a public engagement campaign, but a campaign where friends of the administration, staff, and lobbyists strong-arm people in the public to tell them they should, that they should support this candidate. And the, and the candidate was not doing that, but somebody around the mayor was doing it. Why? Um, and then they justified the media by saying, we have a strong mayor form of government. It's not a dictatorship. We, did, we dealt with that for eight years. It's, we cannot go back to that situation again. In America, I don't know what people don't understand, in America we believe in democracy and balance of powers. A strong mayor form of government doesn't mean you don't listen to anybody else. It doesn't mean you don't listen to the public or listen to city council. So then we gave feedback again and we tried to be respectful of it. And my expectation was we'll get an olive branch, we'll get an apology, and we might get a phone call and maybe a new process. Instead, guess what happened? People around the mayor started introducing the chief nominee as the new police chief. And then the legal department said, you have no right to, to call her a nominee. It has nothing to do with the nominee. It has to do with disrespecting the public and city council. It's misinterpreting. It's misinterpreting. Councilman is speaking. We'll not have that. Keep it's your comments It's misinterpreting the charter. It's interpreting it in a biased way. And again, it's not her fault. It's the administration's fault. And then we got more attacks. We were attacked per consistently in the media. Misleading comments, and my colleague mentioned one a minute ago, seven men can't vote for a woman. Um, uh, all kinds of negative things came out of the communication department of this city. By the way, we approved the budget of the communication department. We also approved the nominee, and we did so in good faith, thinking that that person would be collaborative with us. The St. Pete Times, Tampa Bay Times came out and criticized the administration for the incredibly uh, divisive comments that, that that person made on behalf of the mayor. 
And then um, the private sector can do whatever they want. But when the administration works to sabotage a sitting city council member, or several sitting city council members, that leak information that causes a city council member to have to resign, that is despicable. The public wants the administration to stop the attacks. They want the administration to stop the politics. They want the administration to stop the conspiracy theories, stop the divisiveness, and stop the controversies. Uh, we need to have democracy in our community. We need to work together. And guess what happens, by the way, if you vote yes because you want to get on the good side of the, of the administration? I voted yes on Hatt Avenue. So did Dingfelder. It's one of the worst public policy things in the history of the city of Tampa. And guess what happened? We still got attacked, and Dingfelder is no longer on city council. I would ask the administration to start over, be respectful of the public, be respectful of city council. Let's be respectful of the balance of powers in this community, and let's re be respectful of democracy in this, in this country. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You don't have any of that. You know, my colleagues, as you can see, uh, Ms. O'Connor, it's not personal against you. I was upset yesterday when I called Chief Bennett, right? And the comments of, I wouldn't meet with you when I met with you previously for almost an hour with Janelle McGregor and Marley. And I get calls from people I haven't heard of political people telling me things about an investigation. I'm going to know how the hell do you know that? Mm. Well, and I'm getting accused of retaliation. How do they know this? How do they know that? Well, if you don't do this, you know, you got to do this because, you know, you got a lot of projects on the table. And the mayor might not do your projects. Mm. But I, I tell you, my friends, you know, I've, I've, I've fought vigorously to be very comparable in compromising to the administration. On both sides, I thought I should have went another way, but I've compromised with the administration on several issues. At times when you guys didn't want to support it, but I begged you to stand with your chairman behind me to support the administration. Am I right, Mr. Maniscalco? We feel disrespected time and time again. Mr. Bennett has worked with us. I, I can't blame John because he's worked, he's a compromiser, but I know sometimes it, he has to stay in his, his lane, you know, because there are other powers that be that work with the administration to say, hey, you need to go this way. John's not a combative kind of guy. He don't like controversy. He likes to work things out. You guys have seen that. But there are other powers that are behind this kind of foolishness that's going on with this council, and we're just sick of it. I told you yesterday, Mary, I said, you're a casualty. I said, it ain't your fault, but you might be a casualty in this process. But it ain't, it's not personal against you. It's not. It's not personal at all. I don't know how other members would vote. But what I'm hearing right now, you may be a casualty today. And that's unfortunate, because you do have a good record. You had a blemish. You go to over Eternal Affairs. I got complaints. I got a discipline. A bunch of them over in Eternal Affairs. They, they asked for public records for that, too. So well, who was just asked to ask that, Mr. Carlson? So I, I know the witch hunt is on. But that's OK. I'm a soldier. I have to do what's right for my community. I see Calvin, I see uh, uh, Brian back there. But what I didn't see today, I didn't see not one, not one black officer coming here to speak. I didn't see one. But you guys saw me take Chief Bennett out here earlier. I knew Butch was never going to be the guy from the get-go. I told him at the stadium, you ain't going to die. After so many days, I said, you ain't going to be the guy. I asked Chief Bennett, I said, was Butch made to come here today? He told me, no, he wasn't made to come here today. I take him at his word, but I know how the police department works. That's why you see all the command level staff there, gentlemen. It's, they are a paramilitary organization. They follow orders. It might be some that have a blunder in their mind about what they don't want, but I told you from the get-go, the police department is a military organization. No matter who the chief, they're going to follow the orders. I told Mary yesterday, you may be in theory with the chief, but our charter says that the chief law enforcement officer is the mayor of the city of Tampa. Mm -hmm. So you may be the chief, in theory, but you ain't the chief because, you know, I talk to other chiefs that are good friends of mine. They tell me the same thing. I, things I want to change, I can't change because I have to follow orders by my boss. I like you, Mary. I think you can do a good job. But the community has spoken. It's the process. They felt disrespected. 
And as chairman, I think I've had most, I've had the most controversial issues this year as the chairman of all the issues that have come up. And I think I, I've been a champion to try to get over, over them. I think I've been a champion to get over. We've had a lot of tough votes and issues. And this is the toughest one I would have to make, but I have to look at a Marion Lewis, who's a strong supporter of the police department for everybody, white and black, would come to Marion for vice, but he couldn't make goddamn it major. He couldn't make major. A blemish is, oh, he, he's, he's too aggressive and all these, you know, we had a deal made at one time when the one mayor was running. We promised, he promised he would be at the table. And we got bamboozled on it. I look at Sam Jones. Could never make major. He was the most disciplined black officer in the police department, one wrote. And never could get an opportunity to get to the top because other powers told different chiefs, you can't make that guy because his record. But when, when Eduardo Gonzalez came here, gentlemen, he changed the police department. He, changed the, he diversified the police department because he was someone new, had different ideas, and came here. And first thing, he met Sam Jones. I knew we had a, had a string of car thefts going on, chasing whatever. He came in and said, the only guy that can make a damn decision around here was Sam Jones. And made Sam Jones a captain the next day. I can tell you a lot of stories, gentlemen, a lot of stories, but I wouldn't dare do that to an administration. I know what needs to happen over there. And Mary probably could be that, that person that could make it happen. Being a woman, I can remember when Tina Wright was running with up for it. And now to this day, I feel bad that I didn't give her the support I needed to give her at that time. Because I didn't feel she'd be strong enough. I'm saying that publicly. Sometimes we make decisions that we regret sometimes, and sometimes we make decisions that are hard that we have to make. Today, Mary, is going to be the hardest decision I have to make because, see, when I receive a call from Mr. Clarence, who worked for the city for over 20-something years, and now he's retired, and they ask him to come out here train, and then he goes to file the application, and they tell him his background isn't conducive now, so now he can't come back to work here. This man just retired a year ago, and how he can't come back to work? Do we change the background criteria for, if we say we accept you as our police chief, do we change the background criteria so a person who made a, a possible blemish like you did to be able to come onto the police department? Do, do we have that commitment to do those changes? Like Councilman Guido said, sometimes we do make mistakes. I've made mistakes. I'm gonna keep making them, you know? And sometimes, you know, uh, when I ran, I, you know, at the last minute, I had a flyer come out negative about my police record. The voters saw past that and said that they thought I was a stronger candidate, and, and votes do count. I won by less over, less over 100 votes. Mr. Vera, you, me, you ran. You know how that goes. I told you that yesterday, Mary. It's difficult for this council right now, and sometimes we have to listen to the constituents, and sometimes we have to just make a decision for our constituents. I don't know what that vote may be in a few minutes. I, I wish you well, but all I can say, I, 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 was, I was candid with you yesterday. I was up front. And that's all I can be. I'll take one more round. Is there another question? If not, we'll close it and we'll take a vote. I move to close. Second. All right, Mr. Moran, and move to Mr. Mr. Ben. All right, all right. Thank you, Chairman, for a, a, an opportunity to address council real quick. Uh, two things. One, um, I am the process here. So when we talk about the process, if there is either an apology or continuous improvement or whatever else, I'm the process. And I'll tell you why I'm the process is because all of the names that were mentioned as director, three of them were done in a national search process, irrespective of Mary O'Connor. Osea uh, Wynn was a national search process. Sharisha Hills was a national search process. J.C. Hutchinson was a national search process. And we found that we had the talent in our own backyard. So. I am the process, so I'm looking forward to either now or later to work with council and fix that process. And Chairman of Public Safety, if I offended you in that process, then I'm standing here to apologize in that. Mr. Chair, if I may. You recognize? Chief, you never offend me. <clears throat> you and I have worked together. I'm just stating to you, it would have been, in my opinion, more beneficial to have been in this process, as in any other director or department head who is going to be nominated or appointed for that position. 
whether it be the budget, whether it be solid waste, whether it be parks and recreation. In the future, if I may, just throw in my two cents. And, and I'm, I'm accountable for committee this. chair is, bring them into the process. Chief Bennett, thank you very much for allowing me to say that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, I think that's why in the beginning when we start doing this, I start telling the chief, you need to have these directors come meet with council members before the vote so we can understand who they are and understand what the administration is trying to do. We did that with Nicole. Uh, I think for the police chief, chief, uh, I keep saying it is the most powerful position, not disrespecting Chief Tripp, the fire chief, but the police chief is the most powerful position in the city. To me, more powerful than the mayor. The police chief, and I think that the community assumed that we we, we said when, when the mayor said a national search, they assumed that we'd be a part of that process, uh, like Arrow did. And I, I, gentlemen, I had the chance to sit on uh, on that when uh, when Hogue was made and be a part of that process with uh, association that, uh, with Abel uh, and sat at the table with the uh, the mayor at that time to uh, express our concerns and, and so forth and so on. So I think what has happened is the community felt with. What all is unraveled in the city the last couple of years, they felt that they were going to be a part of the process. And I think maybe that's where it got misguided that they wasn't a part. Mr. Carlson, you recognize. Chief Bennett, you have always been an honest broker working with us, and I appreciate it. Everything you've ever said to me, you've done, and hopefully I've done the same. And you are very well respected in the community. You are a policy wonk like me, and we go through the details. You always go through a lot more data details than I do. The problem here, as, as we've talked about a little bit it, offline, is that there are other people acting around the mayor that you don't have control over. And I'll just ask you one example to put you on the spot for a second. Did you authorize or tell the head of communication to, to say that it's d despicable or whatever the word was, that seven men can't approve a, a woman? Did you direct him to do that? I don't usually engage with communications to so, that point. So the point is you would never do something like that. You would never tell communication to say that two city council members want to, um, to change the charter because they were, they were ineffective ah, at, yeah. at dealing with uh, the, the Charter Review Commission, which we've all talked at length was guided by the last mayor through his appointees and a, and a, and a, um, a city attorney who was carrying water for him. And, uh, and, and so the point is that the things that are going on around around this decision that we don't like, I don't think any of them are related to you. I know you want to take the responsibility because you're an honorable person, but these things have nothing to do with you. And so the, the mayor and you, I hope, can get control of these people. Most of them are on the outside of the city. Some of them are inside the city. The fact that people in the city are leaking documents and talking to the media about city council members is horrible. We've got to stop this. Everybody's asking, why are there so many fights between city council and the mayor's mm. office. And how many times have I come to you and said, please ask them to stop? We just met a couple weeks ago, please ask them to stop. I'm sending emails and asking person, please ask them to stop. We all want to work collaboratively, but <laughs> instead we get more and more tax. We said, please, let's look at this process a different way and we get more tax. This is de democracy as at stake in our city right now. Amen. We've Mr. got to Carlson, protect democracy. Mr. Carlson, I remember Chief Bennett did get on the last communication person in reference to always disrespecting us. And I remember him telling me, he told, he told her, uh, next time he, that happens, he's going to deal with her. I remember that. So I, I appreciate him for doing that. So I don't think it's all Mr. Bennett. You know, again, you know, the mayor office is a political office, and there are other people. And I, I know this guy. He tries to make sure things are right. He's worked with us when there's situations to before it gets out. So uh, we can't lay it all on, on him at all. I just think there's uh, a, a, another part of this process. But I just think that. If we, we always talk about the charter and interpretation, it just seems that sometimes it seems like when we have an eye issue, it doesn't go our way, but uh, it goes the other way. And again, we sit on the charter review and we don't remember the interpretation <laughs> certain ways. Uh, so I think that's why uh, council is, is, is a little upset. Uh, I think that for the most part, she, th th this council here just feels downright just disrespected that uh, about the process and we, we felt we were treated and some of the comments in the paper and some of the things that are going on. And I think moving forward, no matter how this vote is today, I think moving forward we can correct those issues. I know we've got a charter review uh, coming up next week, you know, and behind closed doors, I know you can handle some of those situations to make it better. I know you'll make it better, uh, but I just think uh, things just fell apart and we just got to pick the pieces up and, and put them back together, Mr. Lamb, like you said. We've got to put them back together. 
and, and, and thank you for the feedback, everybody. And again, I'm, I'm just grateful that council was separating the process from Chief O'Connor's uh, ability to lead the, the department. And then the last thing I wanted to say on the record was we, the mayor's office and my office have started a Pathways to Profession, and there's been a lot of second chances given to people that never got a job that I saw in government. And, and we could, you know, we're really ready to celebrate that because we've, we've piloted this project and we have people working here that had never had an opportunity to work in government before. So thank you. Mr. Maniscalco, you didn't get your session papers. Uh, Chief Bennett, real quick, you know, I met with Chief O'Connor, Mayor O'Connor the other morning and I said, John Bennett is a saint and you couldn't pay me to say anything bad about him. And that's how I feel about you. I think you're a very honorable individual and I don't think anybody's putting blame on you and it's already been said, but you know, your reputation speaks for itself. You're a good man. In regards to this uh, upcoming vote now that we're going to take for the chief, um, should I say yes, which I can already hear, you know, people's heads exploding because West Tampa has come out unbelievably again, everywhere I go. However, uh, should you be approved uh, or confirmed? You know, I'd like to have a, a town hall with you. I'm, I'm speaking to Chief O'Connor so that people can um, get to know you. I want to take you out to the naysayers. I know you've done some community outreach, but I want to take you to the regular neighbor that's having his uh, cafe con leche and Cuban sandwich. The people that say, don't do this. You know, I'm telling you, how can you, how can you confirm this individual? I think uh, you can change some people's opinions like that. I mean, you're going to be the chief. If you, if you are confirmed, uh, you're going to be out there. Uh, you're going to see these folks individually, at least, you know, change their minds. You know, just a lot of people have said, once I got to know her, we changed our opinions. And I've heard that from people in this room, people outside of this room, uh, and that's it. Uh, I believe in second chances and forgiveness. Uh, that's not always the case in life. Uh, some people just say no and, and deny that a second chance to set individual for whatever they've done. I am not that kind of person. Uh, again, this is not a uh, war I want to start. You know, we have so many things coming up in the next several weeks. Uh, I think, again, you know, should you be confirmed that we go out in the community together and with all the other council members and let people get to know you, I think we can change their opinions. So, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Rand has put a motion on the floor to close. Second. Mr. Mascano, for a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Madam Clerk, take the vote. Roll call, please. This is number? Number 26, file number F22-73272. Chairman Bowman, uh, I'm the chairman of that committee. Yes, sir. Finance committee. Item 26, file number F22-73272. Resolution confirming the appointment of, by the mayor of the city of Tampa, Mary O'Connor, as chief and head of the city of Tampa Police Department, providing an effective date. Second. So moved. The second by Mr. Uh, Vieira. Roll call. Miranda? Yes. Citro? Chief O'Connor. I expect that if anything happens, the first person you call is your department head. The second person you call is the mayor. Hopefully, the chair of the public safety will be in that group also. I wish you all the best. Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson? Um, with great respect to the uh, nominee, uh, my vote is no because I object vigorously to the process. And I, and even though it looks like this is going to pass, I ask the administration to please start anew tomorrow and let's try to uh, protect our community and bring democracy back. Thank you. And goes. No, I'm respectfully married. I, 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 I'm still going to be your friend. I'm still going to do whatever I need to do to make sure you're successful here. But I have constituents I have to answer to. Uh, I feel the process failed us. But again, I have constituents that I have to answer to in my community. But again, congratulations to and Motion carried with Carlson and Goose voting no. Mr. Chairman, may I say something briefly? I think th this will be my second turn. I guess I appreciate that. You know, I respect everybody's votes. Uh, Councilman Carlson, Councilman Escalco, Good, Citro, uh, Miranda, everybody. Um, I just want to challenge us all um, to continue to work together 
Um, I, I appreciate everybody's remarks. Um, I, I mentioned the term de-escalation, getting along, having our differences. That's great. Let's have our differences. But just, I, I just want to say that I'll make a continued, renewed commitment to uh, continue to work with, with other council members because there's a lot of acute caustic issues out there and uh, we have to keep our, our eyes on constituents. And I just wanted to thank everybody for their remarks. I think everybody was very sincere. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Last thing, you know, we, we could have had this as a tie vote. And I think as a tie vote, as I've asked legal, um, we have a 15 day period in order to confirm or not confirm the chief. That time would have run out. And even with the tie vote, the individual would have been uh, confirmed. I believe if, if legal steps in and says I'm wrong, but I think that's just how the, the charter is written uh, because it's a tie vote. We don't have the seventh council member to break that tie. Um, if anybody has any uh, comment on that, uh, whatever. But uh, again, you know, I think we should move forward. Um, I understand the process was not liked. We have a discussion on the charter that is coming up soon. Then we have to look at changing that. You know, this is, as it's written today, the mayor's nominee. Um, and, and here we are. So that's it. Thank you. Mr. Carl? Thank you, Council. I won't let you down. When I, when I met with now Police Chief, congratulations. A couple days ago, I said, even if I vote no, I will commit to do whatever I can to support you. And especially if, um, if, uh, if you're dealing with any difficulties in my district, I'm happy to stand up and stand beside you and work with you. Uh, the thing I would say to the administration and also to the media since they're here is that um, I've asked the administration to, to bring back democracy and work with city council. The, the pattern in the past is that if, if one or two city council members vote against the administration, somebody in the administration leaks negative information about the council members. Oh, yeah. So if you see a negative story about either of us in the next week, please come back and ask the administration why they did that. Thank you. All right, we'll stay in the journal one third. Let your hair down, baby. Let's have a night to ball.